You're in the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. Now, it's kind of interesting, after last week's Shop Talk session, Shop Talk 2015, I noticed maybe one or two comments in our forums at forum.paracast.com where they, I think, were commenting over the fact that we seemed so down on everything in paranormal research, especially during the first half of the show. But, you know, this is not sweetness and light, folks. This is serious business. Serious things are going on. Serious things are happening to people. And rather than wonder about how the Space Brothers will save us from ourselves, which is certainly not happening, we need to figure out the impact. And sometimes the implications are wide. It takes us into the political world, into the world of the military. You know, it's not something that's just exclusive to ghosts or UFOs from outer space or something like that. It's a lot more complicated. Boy, I'll say. I was a little dismayed at the uh, a couple of comments that were made about my me coming across like I was really getting down on Valet. Valet is one of my all-time heroes in the field, and uh, I have nothing but immense respect for the man and his 60 years of work in the field. Uh, I think it's he's a true pioneer, and he's you know one of the most creative thinkers that have ever applied themselves to these subjects. And, you know, I just uh, made a comment that I felt that concentrating what little time he has left on anecdotal information, uh, data, uh, I think is, is uh, his time, in my opinion, could be spent, uh, better spent uh, attempting to gain hard data, hard data, hard scientific data for current uh, cases. The comment made that I'm all I'm interested in is is lights in the sky is is so ludicrous. The best possible scenario, obviously, is to get triangulated footage of a daylight event and um, to also have magnetometer and gravitometer uh, data as well. A blaze grating would be helpful on a telescope for nighttime sightings, but you know our focus is going to be on on gaining daylight footage and triangulating that. I I have a a pretty good, uh, interesting bit of news here. We have a team that's been working on the on the software modifications for the detect on motion, uh, record on motion software. Uh, it's been quite complicated to go ahead and and customize uh, that particular software. But we have a team in Italy that's uh, been hired to do exactly that, and they are uh, right at the point now where they're finishing up these modifications so that we'll be able to get them integrated into the system. I will be going up to the San Luis Valley uh, in the beginning of May and um, hope to have some uh, some good news for everyone uh, about that visit. It's kind of bittersweet. We're going up to scatter my brother's ashes uh, as per his wish uh, to do that up in the valley. At the same time, I'm going to be speaking at Adams State University, but I have a couple of days to devote to the project and um, I have uh, some other good news too. We, um, I did receive two fairly sizable donations for the camera project, which I'm, I'm very uh, grateful for. This is going to help us uh, pay for bandwidth so that we don't have to rely on the uh, people doing us a favor or giving us something for free. Now that we have a, a, a small budget, we're going to use that to sweeten the pot for an ISP to get involved and uh, supply us with the, you know, the necessary bandwidth that we need in order for this uh, project to go ahead and, and have these cameras uh, be able to function properly. If someone wants to offer a donation or wants more information, just I think the easiest thing to do is go to Chris's site, OurStrangePlanet.com, and there's a donation link there that you can send a donation to Chris and he'll allocate it towards the funding there. Or click the contact link and send him a message about what you're willing to offer. And let's go from there. Are you going to still do that GoFundMe campaign? You know, that's that's another thing. Uh, I, I have uh, two other uh, nice uh, bits of news. I, I had an offer from someone that has some experience with fundraising to, uh, to help out. And also we have someone that is just east of Alamosa, which is the center part of the valley up there, uh, the main town in the valley. And uh, they've offered uh, to allow us to use uh, some of their acreage, however much we need, as a location for one of the camera sites. Uh, We were looking for, you know, a southern leg of our initial uh, triangular uh, array. So this is uh, also very good news. 
you know, things uh, have been moving forward in fits and starts. And, you know, I really want to thank uh, Stefan and, and Detmar for their, their kind donations. And, and it's, it's, it's that kind of, of interest and that kind of, of dedication uh, to the vision that is really going to help this thing uh, move forward. And I'm, I'm really grateful. Always good news. By the way, we have good news for a couple of our listeners, and they use the forum names Kenna Karras and, believe it or not, Jean-Luc Picard. <laughs> and they made a good case for getting free one-year memberships in Paracast Plus. And so they got one-year memberships. If you want to get in on the action, we have this other radio show we do called After the Paracast. And last week, the episode of After the Paracast was the continuation of our Shop Talk episode. We went on for another half hour or so with Burnt State. A lot of the comments that started in this version of the show went to the other to get after the Paracast. Here's what you do. Go check out the instructions on how to sign up at plus.theparacast.com, P-L-U-S dot theparacast.com. It's $5 a month. For two radio shows, the ad-free version of the Paracast, better quality audio, although we'll still hear the dogs in the background when they're barking up a storm. <laughs> we also have after the Paracast. We've got some video content in progress, but so many things have happened. It's going to take a while for us to make it so, but we will. $5 a month, $50 a year, $175 for five years. I think it's a great value. Plus.theparacast.com to make it even greater Chris is donating the ebook version of Stalking the Tricksters for those who sign up for one year or more. That's the only way to get after the Paracast. So that's where you go. So we want you to check that out. Yep. It's going to be really fascinating. Fascinating discussions, of course, always go on in our forums at forum.theparacast.com, forum.theparacast.com. That's, of course, where we have the opportunity for you to ask questions of our guests like Kevin Randall, who will be with us in a few moments, but also to talk about anything and everything in this crazy paranormal universe. <laughs> yeah. Boy, crazy is, uh, I think, being kind, Gene. It's, uh, it's sometimes it just boggles my mind how insane some of these, uh, these uh, subjects and uh, opinions and infighting can get. And I'm, it's just, we're going to find out uh, a little bit more about this current uh, debacle that's going on uh, pertaining to these so-called Roswell slides, which uh, I'm sure we're going to have uh, a real interesting session today with Kevin. Oh, yeah. Now, of course, Kevin Randall has been in and around the UFO field for several decades. He's one of the key researchers into Roswell. He is not directly involved in the Roswell slides, and therein lies a tale by the way, and he has this blog. Just Google a different perspective. And some people you know from the forums, by the way, participate there in responding to his comments. He has a couple of things a week on all sorts of subjects, not just Roswell, but other things regarding paranormal research, backgrounds. Remember, the thing here is that Kevin Randall has a real 100% honest-to-goodness military record. He was in the military. It's not a case of some of these other people like David Roundtree and Phil Ambrogno, where they invented military credentials that were not borne out by their actual discharge papers, which they will not produce, by the way. You know, so I'm going to ask also, Kevin, about that, why we have these so-called stolen valor episodes where people feel they need to fake their military credentials. Mm -hmm. You know, are their egos so shattered in real life and that's all they can do? Yeah. I don't know. Jeez. We'll have to see. Kevin Randall coming up with Gene and Chris. You're in the Paracast. <laughs> First came Attack of the Rockoids, and it was a critically acclaimed success. And now there is the coming of the Protectors. A former military intelligence man is contacted by a space woman in a dream. A dream that turns out to be a nightmare, because evil forces on our distant planet are planning to conquer the Earth. This is gripping science fiction of the classic kind. 
Attack of the Rockoids, and The Coming of the Protectors. Find out more at rockoids.com. That's rockoids, R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S, dot com. So here's what happened. I was placing an order online. The site went down. It took hours before it returned, but I'd already placed the order with another company. If your site goes down, you could lose business. And if you have a business or personal site, you'll want to know it's easy to run and it will stay online. At iWeb, your site is hosted on one of the most reliable networks in the world. Talk to a sales rep at iWeb.com. Use the promo code TECHNIGHTOWL for a special discount. Hi, John Huebner from Midas Resources. Are you tired of watching your hard-earned assets dwindle away? As government spending is out of hand and the Federal Reserve is creating in excess of $20 billion a week, are you tired of stockbrokers gambling away your hard-earned money? Is this market a setup for a crash greater than 1987? Too many of today's policies resemble those that led to the collapse of 1929. This is John Huebner, and that was me in 2007. And we all know what happened when the subprime credit bubble burst. By March 2009, the dollar lost 50% of its value. The entire U.S. banking system was on the verge of collapsing. Like all financial problems of the past, is history about to repeat itself? Call me, John Huebner, at 1-800-686-2237, extension 129, before it's too late to protect yourself. Will the oncoming catastrophe take all private IRAs, 401ks with it? There is a way to protect your hard-earned assets. Call me, John Huebner, at 1-800-686. 2237 extension 129. I have bought a few bottles of heart and body extract and have to say that it, it certainly does work. That's what Jack from Michigan had to say after his experience with heart pain and what he did to treat it with heart and body extract. I actually had a huge heart flutter. I was also having some edema around my ankles and very worrisome clot in my uh, right leg that would happen from time to time while I was trying to sleep. Heart and body extract is all natural with no negative side effects. It will help repair or correct past problems associated with the heart and body circulation. After my second bottle of heart and body extract, all problems are now gone. Order at hbextract.com or call 866-295-5305. I ordered a third bottle of heart and body extract for maintenance as I want to keep everything working. Order heart and body extract at 866-295-5305 or hbextract.com. Heart and body extract for a long and healthy life. If you constantly feel run down and tired, your pH level might be low and your body could be full of toxins. If what you drink is not at a pH level of 8 or higher, you are inviting bacteria and acid to thrive in your body. But there is something you can do. Simply add 10 drops of AlkaVision Plasma pH drops to your water to help your body rid itself of acidic waste, increase oxygen, and raise your pH balance to optimum levels. AlkaVision Plasma pH drops combine a unique formula of the most alkaline minerals in the world. Alkalizing the water you drink, ridding your body of acidic waste and toxins, and helping you regain energy and vibrant health. And studies show viruses, bacteria, and toxins cannot survive in an alkaline, high pH environment. Order your bottle of AlkaVision Plasma pH drops at AlkaVision.com. That's A-L-K-A Vision.com. Or call 269-409-1776. 269-409-1776. Alkalize your body. Supercharge your health at AlkaVision.com today. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. Joining us once again, one of our favorite guests on the Paracast, somebody who has really done years and years of solid research in the UFO mystery, and he's a no-nonsense kind of guy. Kevin Randall, welcome back on the PowerCast. Well, thank you very much. Glad to be on the PowerCast. PowerCast. (laughs) Hey, people do that. You know, Tim Beckley kept calling us PowerCast for about five years, I think. (laughs) Well, I've got an excuse. I've been sick. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. What Can you mention what's wrong or? Uh, Just some... Problems with old age, I guess. It's gotten better now. Yes, I worry about that. As I start feeling my back suffering under the pain, you know. There we don't want to make this show up a couple of old codgers talking about their aches and pains and, you know. <laughs> that that yeah. makes us even older. 
comparing yeah, was, our maladies. <laughs> comparing to this young whippersnapper, Chris O'Brien. <laughs> Jeez. Boy, I sure don't feel young. <laughs> Not after this last month, boy. It's been a real doozer. <laughs> Kevin, I'm going to ask you one thing because of the fact that you have this solid military background. We've come across people in the UFO field and paranormal research in general. And I can name a couple, but I'm not going to bother, who fake their military credentials. They don't have the discharge papers. They don't have anything. They want to tell you they were heroes in Vietnam and elsewhere. Why do we have these things? Is it ego or what? I think a lot of it is ego. I was stunned to learn a number of years ago, uh, there's, there's like 2.5 million Vietnam veterans. And in the 1990 census, one of the questions on the census was, are you a Vietnam veteran? 13 million people said yes. 10 million people were lying about it. <laughs> wow. Why would you lie about it on a census form? It's, 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 it's astounding. I know that a lot of people who avoided the Vietnam War now want to claim that they were participants in it because the attitude of people towards military has changed. And I think that if you claim a military background, then you have sort of instant credibility. And I think that's part of it as well. So part of it's ego, part of it is the credibility it brings to us. And, and I've run into guys who were in Vietnam and they lie about what they did there. I think just enough, it's enough to say you're a Vietnam veteran. And now I feel that anytime I go out and say, well, you know, I was in Vietnam, people are wondering if I'm lying about it. But if anybody wants to get my records from St. Louis, they will find out I did in fact serve in Vietnam. When I've said something about my military background, it's all backed up by the documentation. If people tell you that they've they served in Vietnam, but their records are classified and it's a secret and they can't tell you what they did, that might be true, but the records are going to reflect service in Vietnam. The records are going to reflect the training that they would have had to go through. All of that's going to be in the records, and that's not classified. Sometimes there's classified missions. Some guys were awarded decorations for participation in the classified missions. And while the details are classified, the decoration itself is not, so it would be recorded in the records. So I don't get it. A, a, a really great example is, is, what is it, Robert French, who was a retired Air Force lieutenant colonel. And I mean, he had an impressive military career, but he had to lie about it to, to I guess, place himself into the Roswell arena. Now, the Robert French, French, tell our listeners who he is or Robert, was. Robert French claimed that he had um, come across some of the Roswell stuff while he was engaged in some other activities, and he talked about uh, um, what he had seen and what he knew. It. He was one of the few people to see this a MJ-12 document, not one of the, but a different MJ-12 document, claimed to be a, have been a member of Project Blue Book, and uh, he actually helped write the Blue Book. And I'm thinking if anybody should know what Blue Book was. It was a guy who served with it should know that there wasn't a Blue Book. It was, in fact, the name of the investigation. But he had an, an impressive military career. He was awarded a Silver Star. He was awarded a Distinguished Flying Cross. Uh, he did serve in Vietnam, at, I, I think, at least one time. But he claimed, he claimed well, he had, been a, had flown in Korea, but he went to flight school in 1954. He did serve in Korea, but he wasn't a, a pilot at the time. So, I mean, he just sort of massaged his record for some unknown bizarre reason. But when you when you sit down to it and the stories he begins to tell about his UFO experiences with the military, then you have to kind of question what's going on because you see these other problems. So we run into that all the time. I mean, here's a guy with a, with a very nice military record, and he had to kind of spoil everything by making up additional things about it. You wonder about people. I claim no military record. You know, I, I claim a military record. I served in Vietnam. I served in Iraq. And if you write to St. Louis to get my record, you'll find out that that's the truth. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting here. Explain to our listeners how to do that. Basically, your military record, unless there's something classified about it, which may reflect a certain portion of it. But otherwise, your military record is publicly available. Parts of it are. The Privacy Act of 1974 changed the situation and then... With all the identity theft going on, it's changed the situation even more. But if you write to St. Louis, the uh, National Archives in St. Louis, and that's where all the military records are stored. If you served in the military and you're, you retired, you're left the military, you've been discharged, whatever, the records are shipped to St. Louis. 
and you can write there. And if you've got the guy's name, and it helps if they have a serial number and a birthday. But I've actually gotten records by saying, you know, here's here's the guy's name. Here's what I know about when he served. What can you tell me about this guy? You can find out what their assignments were. You can find out what awards and decorations are. You'd find out whether they were honorably discharged. You can find out whether they served in a combat zone or not. Oftentimes, what their assignments were and what their military schools were. So you you can learn a great deal about them, and you can find out whether or not these guys are lying about their military background. And I shouldn't say these guys because the women are doing it too. That information is all available and it, it becomes more and more limited as time goes by simply because they're attempting to protect the, the service members or former service members from, from identity theft and all of that because they used to give you an awful lot more information than they do now. But they'll verify the military background. I think if you write and ask for my Air Force records, you end up with me being just a first lieutenant but if you write to get my army records, then you find I was promoted into field grade. So there are some problems with that. And you have to be aware of those sorts of things. Sometimes not everything is transcribed on the records properly. Sometimes there's gaps in it. So you have to be careful before you start accusing some people of, of lying about their military background. But, I mean, there are other ways of verifying it. I've got the DD Form 214s. I've got a huge, basically a file drawer full of all kinds of military records, including <laughs> copies of uh, travel vouchers that I've had to, I had to had to put together. I've got my flight records from Vietnam. Uh, I've just got all kinds of records. So if anybody wanted to challenge it, I've got the documentation to prove it. Uh, other people say, well, you, you, you've lost the documentation. This guy named Robert Willingham, who claimed that he had seen a UFO crash in well, either 1948 or 1950 or 1954, depending on the time of the year he's telling the story. And he was the only guy there, and he was an Air Force fighter pilot, and he did all this crap in Korea. And I wrote to get his records and find out, found out that he'd been in the Army from December of 1945 to January of 1947, which is, what, 13, about 13 months. He's technically, technically a veteran of World War II because the war wasn't declared officially over until the middle of 1946. So anybody who had served even after the Japanese had surrendered prior to the middle of 1946 is considered a veteran of, of World War II. Let's do the break here and then we'll get into okay. more of this. It's Kevin Randall with Gene and Chris. You're in The Paracast. The nation's largest independently owned and operated talk radio network. The Genesis Communications Network. GCN. Is there a secret UFO agenda? Do strange creatures from the darkest corners of the mind roam the earth? Is there evidence for mind control, time travel, or devious government conspiracies? Find out the inside scoop on the latest conspiracies paranormal activity, and Freudian phenomena when you subscribe to Tim Beckley's Conspiracy Journal. It's jam-packed with stories, special book and DVD promotions, and the best news, it's absolutely free, sent right to your mailbox. Plus, a bonus free email newsletter sent out every Friday. Simply send an email with your name and address to MrUFO at webtv.net. That's Mr. UFO at webtv.net. Find out what they don't want you to know. By now you may have heard a bit about Bitcoins, but did you know Bitcoins are now over an $8.5 billion market? And did you know that over 65,000 businesses now accept Bitcoins? Listen, if you're already earning Bitcoins or trying to make money in the Bitcoin market, you've got to know BidBit.co. Why? Because BidBit.co is where you can easily receive Bitcoins by selling and auctioning off your own personal items or promote business products and services for Bitcoins. You heard right. Whether personal or business, you can now buy, sell, and auction your product and services quickly, easily, and securely for Bitcoin at BidBit.co, the first and only marketplace website to offer BidBit escrow, a proprietary technology which gives buyers and sellers security and peace of mind because all transactions are protected. Start today. It's free to join, free to post, free to auction, and free to bid at BidBit.co. Buy, sell, bid, or auction everything Bitcoin. That's www.bidbit.co. BidBit.co. 
Don't complain about your cable bill going up and up and up. Do something about it. Grab a pencil and jot down this special number. 1-855-905-MY-TV. The more cable TV rates go up, the better digital satellite TV looks. Say goodbye to the cable guy. And get more of your favorite channels in 100% digital quality for less money. Call 1-855-905-MY-TV. Sign up for packages starting as low as $19.99 and there's no equipment to buy. You get free HD TV upgrade, a free DVR upgrade, and free professional and installation you control what you watch when you watch it record your favorite shows pause and rewind live tv even skip the commercials watch local channels too at just $19.99 what are you waiting for pull out your major credit or debit card call 1-855-905-MY-TV 1-855-905-MY-TV say goodbye to the cable guy cut costs and get more 1-855-905-MY-TV 1-855-905-MY-TV this alert just came in. This special announcement is for business owners and leaders of organizations who've been waiting for the right time to build. General Steel has made it impossible to wait any longer with rock-bottom prices that could save you thousands. That's right. General Steel, America's leader in pre-engineered structures, is offering buildings at prices you will never see again. Don't miss these prices. A 50 by 100 for $35,000. You heard right. That's 5,000 square feet for $35,000. Manufacturing. If you need a larger building, try a 100 by 100 commercial building for $129,000. You can't afford to rent with these prices. Imagine a 70 by 100 foot church building for under $69,000. With the economy improving and interest rates still at historic lows, you can't afford to wait. So call 866-91-STEEL. Lock in your price now. Call 866-91-STEEL. That's 866-917-8335. Hi, this is Don Ecker, and you are tuned in to the Paracast. Let me tell you what, you're going to hear stuff here that you probably won't hear anywhere else. Hear that, George Snorri? We have Kevin Randall with Gene and Chris in the Paracast, and we were basically joking about the fact before we started with this segment of the fact that one episode using some new software, for some reason, my part of the conversation, humble as it is, was not recorded. Now, you were telling me, Kevin Randall, before we broke, about someone who was claiming extra military credentials because of his involvement, his involvement with the UFO case. Would you continue? Well, it was Robert Willingham who claimed that he was a retired lieutenant colonel, a retired fighter pilot. And his first version of the story, which I actually found finally in Skylook, magazine, which was a precursor to the New Fun UFO Journal, but it's a Skylook from March of 1968, and the paragraph is on page three, where he claimed that he'd seen, he'd been involved in, in some kind of a military operation, a training operation, and they'd seen a UFO crash just over the border in Mexico, and he'd landed at his base, Dias Air Force Base, and then had gone in a private plane down there and landed, and the Mexicans chased him away, but he saw the crash, and he got a piece of metal and all this. But his story hung on the point that he was a fighter pilot. He said that he'd been uh, badly injured in Korea. Um, and so he had, he'd left the active duty Air Force to, to fly in the reserve because they wouldn't let him fly in the active duty forces anymore because of his injury. And I, I knew a number of Air Force fighter pilots, so I asked him about that. And he said, that's not true. The problem is the ejection. If you have injured your back or you have some injury and it would be exasperated, exasperated by by ejection, then you're taken out of the flight profiles that put you into an ejection seat. So he could fly bo some of the bombers. He could fly cargo planes. So he wasn't removed from the cockpit. So his story was utterly ridiculous. I wrote and got his let record from St. Louis and discovered that he had 13 months of, of uh, military service. He presented some documentation. You can see that they'd been altered, that he changed them. Um, he actually had been a member of the Civil Air Patrol for a long time. Civil Air Patrol is the civilian auxiliary of the Air Force, and it performs some very valuable services. The Civil Air Patrol does in search and rescue and things like that. And he's got he's got records for that. But he tried to convert it to Air Force Reserve so he could get some kind of a pension. Actually involved his congressional representatives in that, and they couldn't get anywhere on it. And he said, well, it's because I was involved in this UFO crash. No, it's because you made the thing up. And if you look at the records, you can see he made them up. So there's people that do that sort of thing, and and uh, um, and, it, and it and it hurts UFO research, but it, it it also hurts the veterans because it makes 
people question the veterans when they say something, you know, I did this. They say, well, maybe he's just another one of these guys making the stuff up. And like I said, with the, with the Vietnam veterans, the majority of the people claiming Vietnam service probably couldn't find a place on a map. Let's move into some other subjects since we touched briefly upon Roswell. Now, so sometime back, we had talked, you and I, about this so-called Roswell Dream Team to kind of look at the case and see if they can come up with more evidence. Whatever happened to that? Well, part of the problem is that um, the ultimate purpose was to write the ultimate Roswell book by, by reinvestigating the case carefully looking at it as a cold case now and going back through the records and seeing what we could find out what we could learn what we might have missed what should be going what should should go on but uh, we sort of drifted apart simply because um, their investigation went in one direction and we couldn't get things organized the way we wanted to so i i dropped out of the team two years ago i think because it, it just wasn't doing what it was supposed to do. And and part of the problem was what I was doing, but part of the problem was that Don and Tom were involved in something else, some other investigation, and that kind of distracted them from, from our ultimate purpose. So um, they continued on with their work, and I've gone in my own direction on my work. All right. So is part of that this story about the alleged Roswell slides? Yes. <laughs> to put it succinctly. Um, although I, I just saw or heard or read uh, something over the last couple of days that uh, the term Roswell slides is a debunking term used by the debunkers to belittle the idea of the slides, and they're really not connected to Roswell specifically. There might be some other crash or some other aliens, uh, although when you listen to Don and Tom talk during this interview, it's clear that they believe they're related directly to Roswell, even though they say that they've Roswell Slides is a bad term for it. But yes, it has to do with the Roswell Slides. <laughs> okay, this is Tom Carey and Donald Schmidt who were involved in Roswell Slides. Yes. Now, we've had active discussions in our forums. Kevin has had extremely active discussions over at his blog, A Different Perspective. Now, can you, in 2,000 words or less or whatever, explain to our listeners what this Roswell Slides thing is how to get started. According to what Don and Tom have said and what I've been able to deduce from what they've said, a woman was cleaning out a house in Arizona uh, for apparently an estate sale. And as she was going through the materials, they found she found this box of slides, 400 some odd slides, and she looked at a couple of them and thought that they might be interesting. So rather than throw the box away, she kept it, took it home, did not look at it for a while. And one day, a couple of years later, she's looking at it. And this, this kind of makes no sense to me because I'm thinking if I've taken a box of slides home because I think they're interesting, I'm going to look at them right away. But she sat on the slides for a couple of years, and inside the lid of the box, there was an envelope tape with these two slides in it. And when she looked at them, it kind of creeped her out. Um, so she sent those off to a relative, I believe it was her brother, and he looked at them, or eventually looked at them. Uh, the, the, she was cleaning out the house, I think, in 1990. She sent the slides to her brother in 1998. Uh, he finally looked at them around 2000, and he thought, uh, he, he said, well, he's, he's not a UFO guy, but he looked around the Internet and for stuff on Roswell, and he got in contact with Tom Carey and sent him the slides uh, early in, 19, in in 2012, it might have been, I think. Um, so uh, they looked at the slides. They tried to deduce what they might show. They looked at all kinds of possibilities, and they concluded, given the um, sleeve the slides were in, the, the cardboard sleeves that they're mounted in, was only used by Kodak from, I think, 1941 to 1949, and they said the film was manufactured in 1947, though I'm not sure exactly how they, they got to that, because that hasn't been precisely explained. But because of that, they've, the slides are connected to Roswell. It shows a, apparently a being of three and a half to four feet tall. The head is separated from the body. The body is, doesn't look it's humanoid as opposed to human. If there's four fingers instead of 
five that like we have, and the head is more pear shaped than than anything. So they they have concluded that this might be an alien creature. I do not understand why somebody who was given two slides would deduce that it's alien and in contact uh, Roswell researchers. The chain of custody is broken because there's gaps of where the slides might have been. There is no provenance for them because we don't know really who took the slides. We know who took the slides, other slides in the box. It's um, Hilta Ray and Bernard Ray, uh, but we don't know if they took those specific slides. Uh, so there's all kinds of problems with the, with these with these slides that that are somewhat reminiscent of the alien autopsy, which didn't turn out real well. Um, but they've been sitting on these things for a number of years. They've supposedly shown them to experts in various fields. Uh, Tom was talking about they had two Canadian anthropologists who said, well, we don't know what they show, but um, they couldn't get any American scientists to look at them or American news media interested in it. Um, and, and I kind of understand that given the history of the, the UFO phenomenon in this country. Uh, but they claim that in on May 5th, they're going to reveal all that they know and everything will be um, out there for display so we can see exactly how they arrived at the point they have arrived at. Let's go into more of this. Roswell Slides. Kevin Randall is our guest with Gene and Chris. You're in the Paracast. Great minds think alike. The network for the independent minded. The Genesis Communications Network. GCN. Attack of the Rockoids has been well received by critics and readers alike. It's a thrill a minute story you'll never forget. A former U.S. military intelligence officer is haunted by intense dreams about a beautiful woman pleading for his help after a terrible battle in outer space. But the dreams turn out to be true and thrust him into a telepathic love affair with a woman whose faraway planet is intent on destroying the Earth. And now the gripping tale continues in The Coming of the Protectors. It's the second book of the Rockoids trilogy, a galaxy-spanning adventure that pits our hapless heroes against powerful, fanatical enemies that threaten the lives of freedom-loving beings everywhere. Attack of the Rockoids and The Coming of the Protectors, classic science fiction at its best, available now. For more details, visit rockoids.com. That's R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S dot com. If the IRS has garnished your paycheck or seized money from your bank account, you need to get professional tax help now. Fast action is required to put a halt to these aggressive IRS collection tactics. You can count on the knowledgeable team of tax professionals at Wall & Associates. With over 30 years of experience, Wall & Associates has settled the tax problems of thousands of taxpayers for a small fraction of what they owed. For a free face-to-face -face consultation, call 1-800-425-4610 to put a wall between you and the IRS, 1-800-425-4610, or look for us on the web at wallandassociates.net. We solve tax problems. If you hire Wall & Associates today, you'll never have to talk to the IRS again. To stop the levies and seizures today, take action now. Call Wall & Associates at 1-800-425-4610. Wall & Associates, 1-800-425-4610. Based on actual cases, results may vary, not a solicitation for legal services. Pharmacist Ben Fuchs believes virtually all disease states can be backtracked to digestive problems. Deficiencies in stomach acid can affect all downstream systems. Taking digestive enzymes can be amazingly helpful for dealing with deficiencies in stomach acid. Enzymes require low pH for activation. You can also use aloe vera juice, by the way. Sugars in aloe vera have a coating effect on the digestive system. Longevity has a cool product called Noni Plus, which is made from aloe and the noni fruit. It's tasty. It can also function to support digestive acidification, acidification of the stomach, and activation of digestive enzymes. Take pharmacist Ben's advice and support your digestive system by ordering Noni Plus from Longevity. Call 866-735-2470. That's 866-735-2470 or on the web at brightsideben.com. That's brightsideben.com. Order today. 
For over five years, you've been hearing about the Berkey guy, so you may know a few things about him. For example, you are well aware of the superior quality and effectiveness of Berkey water filters and accessories. But did you know the Berkeys have had independent lab tests done to prove just how effective they are? It's true, and he can email you the test results. Just visit GoBerkey.com. You may also know that the Berkey guy has helped tens of thousands of people get better prepared. Now here's something you may not know. GoBerkey.com has amazing specials and deals all the time on a wide variety of survival and preparedness products, most ready to ship same day. Visit the Berkey guy at GoBerkey.com and be sure to click the red Products on Sale Now button. You can always call toll-free 877-886-3653. Again, that's 877-886-3653. GoBerkey.com, home of the Berkey guy. Hi, this is James Fox from Chasing UFOs. You're listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. Now, I know when we do our supplementary radio show after the Paracast, we'll go more into our reactions, Chris and I, to learn more about how to get after the Paracast. You need to sign up for the Paracast Plus. Go to plus.theparacast.com, P-L-U-S dot theparacast.com. We're talking to Kevin Randall about the Roswell Slides. Now, a lot of this stuff to me, Kevin, and Chris, I think, agrees with most of this, a lot of this seems a stretch. You're stretching a lot of things to possibly indicate a point. And one is, of course, you're seeing something that looks like it may be an alien creature. But how do you know from a photograph whether it's a living creature or not something that a Hollywood studio mocked up? I, I think the theory on that, and remember, I'm just, I am speculating on what their theories are. I have only seen the really crappy slides that, that, that somebody captured, captured from a screen, a screen capture uh, of, of uh, a documentary or a preview of a documentary about this. But I think what they looked at was Hollywood was not looking at aliens in this way in the late 1940s. If you look at what they were doing in the science fiction movies and all of that in the late 1940s, the aliens didn't look anything like this. I think that point could be argued, but especially when you look at the coverage of some of the science fiction magazines were out in the late 30s and early 40s. Uh, but it, it, it's they've got a good high-definition slide, and they were unable to match it to anything that Hollywood might have done. They say it's not a mummy, which... They've looked at hundreds of pictures of mummies, so they're they're convinced that by looking at the picture and eliminating what it uh, what it isn't, they they eventually arrive at it being alien. I'm not sure that the logic follows precisely on that, but that's kind of the argument they're making. They, we've looked at everything, we've tried to identify it, we've been unable to do for it. Therefore, it is alien. Chris? Yeah, one thing that, uh, Kevin, that I've been wondering about and has been mentioned uh, by several people uh, at uh, at your blog is the actual uh, setting that appears in the slides or that, you know, we can assume uh, appears in the slides based on, as you mentioned, uh, the, uh, not a very well um, put together quality wise uh, version of the slides from that screen capture. But it, it just doesn't make sense to me that something that could be the most, uh, you know, arguably the most historic find of in all human history would be displayed on a simple blanket under a glass case. Uh, it just doesn't it it just doesn't make sense to me. Something uh, as as important as that and and being biological in nature, you would think would be in some sort of hermetically sealed container. You wouldn't have a handwritten sign. Uh, <laughs> in the display, for instance, um, that part of it, uh, just alone to me, just, I don't know, it just doesn't add up. And, and what are your thoughts about that? I mean, wouldn't you think that something like that would be, uh, would be kept in, in a more, um, hermetically sealed or pristine, uh, environment? Let's run with that just a little bit further. How would these two people who lived in Midland, Texas, 
be allowed to photograph something like this? How did they get to the point where they could actually take the photographs if, in fact, they took the photographs? I can think of no scenario where they would see it. They've attempted to link them to the, the Eisenhowers because there's pictures of Eisenhower in this box of slides. And I'm thinking you could link me to David Letterman because I got pictures of me with David Letterman in Iraq. That doesn't mean that we are in close communication and that he's going to invite me on his show at any time before he, before he retires. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't know how these people would have got in to photograph it if, in fact, they were the ones who photographed it. If they didn't, we don't know who took the photographs. Therefore, we don't know how they got in to take it. The display seems to be more like you would expect if somebody had um, recovered a mummy. And, and I think Peruvian mummies are the ones that, that have been pointed to most, most frequently. But if it was an anthropological or an archaeological um, recovery of something like that, then you might have the thing laying on an army blanket in behind a glass case because it is, in fact, just a mummy, not an alien creature. Um, I'm not sure exactly what um, the prehistoric peoples in the Southwest might have done with, with, their, um, with their dead and how much mummification went on. But I know in that dry environment that things are mummified by accident, if you will, or by ma nature. So it could be something that was recovered in the Southwest uh, like that. So, you know, there, there are all these problems with it. And, and, and that display is one of the problems. It looks from, from the, the, the screen capture that we have, if it's laying, it's laying on some kind of a shelving unit, like you would see, you know, like you see in the, the back rooms of an awful lot of museums, um, where they, where they, the, the things that are not on exhibit are kept uh, organized. So there, there's all kinds of problems with that. I know Tom said at one point, you can tell it's on a green army blanket. I'm not sure how you can tell that from a slide that it's an army blanket, other than the army blankets were pretty crappy and they're green colored. But we haven't seen the the actual good quality slides that might reveal some of that information to us and we won't see that until until May 5th and that might answer some of our questions about it but it also might reveal exactly what it is because you'll have everybody on this brother on the internet trying to find a, a picture of a mummy that matches this more or less and I think that some have come very close even with the um, the screen grab that we have so we we've, we've got a real a lot of real problems like that. And, and, and like, I mean, we start with the lack of providence. Who took the pictures? Well, it might have been these people, but it might not. Um, how did they get from the, the photographing of the alien creature to this guy holding them uh, in Chicago? How do we get to that point? So there's a lot of problems that we do not have answers for and we're pro promised answers for, but, but in, my communications uh, before I guess I, I pissed off Don and Tom, um, it was pretty clear that they really don't have a good provenance for them. And that's going to be that's going to be the real bugaboo in the beginning. You cannot say this person took the pictures. We cannot identify who the photographer was. And that's going to be that's going to be the first major hurdle they're going to have to leap. And I don't think they can do it. Mm. Yeah. And not to mention the circus-like uh, <laughs> atmosphere that uh, appears to be building around the uh, Mexico uh, City and event sure that's that, being planned. I, and I'm not sure that Tom and Don are completely responsible for the circus-like atmosphere. I think this Adam Dew guy in Chicago who is, who is producing the documentary to go with this is, is sort of responsible for that by putting up on YouTube uh, bits and pieces of the documentary so we can see see what they have um so i uh, it there's there's some real problems with it and and i just cannot see how they're gonna how they're gonna be able to overcome some of the problems because they just do not have the information they said they're going to prove uh they're going to provide all of this information and they've got all these scientists lined up to to make pronouncements about the legitimacy of the slides and clearly the slides clearly are their pictures of some kind of creature whether it's a mummy or or something else but but to get it to the um, extraterrestrial and link it to Roswell, I just don't think they can do it. Well, the thing that bothers me about all this is in the run-up to this May 5th event, we've got people writing blogs that 
in one case, a certain UFO researcher writes in a rather National Enquirer kind of tone. I hope that's not me. No, it's not you. <laughs> but you know what I mean. He hypes the thing to the nth degree. And don't you think here that if they really had compelling evidence that something significant is contained in these slides, they would simply say, we're going to have this event and here's the evidence. But when you're trying to force the issue, creating what might be unreasonable expectations, it strikes me as what Microsoft used to do. For example, they'd tout all these new software and hardware products they're going to introduce. And they don't do it really much anymore, but they used to. And the products would never come out. Or if they came out, they'd not have the features promised. And that goes back to Windows Vista for those who study the tech universe. <laughs> okay. And you know what I mean? There were things there that were supposed to be there. So we're getting the same kind of hype here. And then I wonder, okay, you have something here. It might be the most significant discovery of our age. Proof that alien creatures landed somewhere. Their bodies are recovered. If everything that's promised is true, that's the, what we would expect. So what are they doing? They're holding the event, a paid event, not in the U.S., not with scientists, but in Mexico City? That doesn't make sense to me. We'll try to make more sense of it. We have Kevin Randall with Gene and Chris. You're in. The Paracast. Not just an alternative to the mainstream media. We're the premier independent talk radio network. We are GCN. By now, you heard about Bitcoins, but did you know that over 65,000 businesses accept Bitcoins? Listen, if you're already earning Bitcoins or trying to make money in the Bitcoin market, you've got to know BidBit.co because at BidBit.co, you can receive Bitcoin by selling your personal items or business products. You heard right. Whether personal or business, you can now buy, sell, and auction your products quickly, easily, and securely at BidBit.co. That's B-I-D, B-I-T dot C-O, BidBit.co. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. Have you ever wondered why banks, stockbrokers, investment advisors won't talk about gold IRAs? They've been available since 1986, yet the financial industry won't recognize the value of gold for your retirement. Gold has outperformed paper investments, yet no word about IRAs. If you would like to have gold for your retirement, call 800-686-2237. Don't get left behind by rising inflation and low returns. Call 800-686-2237. Secure your future and call 1-800-686-2237. Ouch! My back is out again. Hi, Dr. Ortman with Wellspring Spinal Care. If you're experiencing neck, mid, or lower back pain, this information is for you. One of the complaints that I hear is patients receive their typical adjustment, only having to repeat them as the pain returns. Putting the bones back in place is only half of the battle. At Wellspring Spinal Care, we have the entire solution. We use the NUCA approach, utilizing three-dimensional x-rays and gentle touch technology to deliver specific correction. We then design Design a custom nutritional supplement program which provides essential nutrients targeting the areas of concern. With a NUCA approach and proper nutrition, you'll be on your way to a faster and more permanent recovery. To get you on the road to wellness, visit DrOrtman.com. That's Dr. O-R-T-M-A-N.com. Or call us today, 952-303-9124. That's 952-303-9124. Wellspring Spinal Care, chiropractic done right. Welcome back to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. So I don't want to be negative Nelly here, or a negative Nat, or whatever. With Gene and Chris in the Paracast, Kevin Randall, and I think you get the sense of my concerns about this, that they're trying too hard to hype it in advance of the event. It's become almost a show business thing. And they're holding it in Mexico City. Why? Because that was where they were able to get the venue. I, w I wouldn't mind a trip to Mexico City. I, there's a lot of neat things to see around Mexico City. But <laughs> I, I think the problem is some of the information leaked way early. It's not really the fault of, of Don or Tom that it leaked early. 
but some of the information came, that got out uh, shouldn't have and made it a little bit more difficult for them to do their investigation. I, I think that the way to do this would have been to, okay, we've got these slides. Now, how do we, how do we validate these things and do it quietly until you've got all your ducks in a row and then announce we're going, we're going, here's what we're going to do. I think of back in 1997, which is much longer ago than I care to, to, care to think about, at the 50th anniversary of the, of the Roswell crash, the big hype was they had a piece of debris, and it was going to be demonstrated at the 50th anniversary. The chain of custody had been preserved, and they were going to announce it. They were going to explain who had the medal, how he had acquired it, and, and they had the scientific analysis. And the auditorium there at the um, New Mexico Military Institute was filled with people and reporters waiting to see this thing. And they came on the stage and they made their presentation. They sneaked the scientists in the back door. He made his presentation. He left before questions were answered. We were never told who had the debris. The chain of custody was not presented. And then when you found the scientist and you talked to him, you found out that he was talking about isotopic ratios in the structure of the metal. Of The isotopic ratios did not match that which you'd find naturally on Earth which means it was a manufactured piece of material. All well and good, except the isotopic ratios did not exclude it from having been produced on Earth. So it wasn't this great thing that we had expected. All of the information that we had been told prior to the thing showing up turned out not to be true. The scientist turned out not to be a professor at the university. He was in some other capacity there. He wasn't, um, he wasn't teaching. Uh, I don't think he was in research. I forget exactly what he was doing, but but he was he worked at the university, but not in the capacity you would have would have hoped for. And it all came apart. I, you know, I've raised questions repeatedly over the last couple of months, several months, about some of the issues I have that they haven't answered the questions for, and I hope they answer them in Mexico City, but I don't think they can. And without qu answers to those specific questions, I think they have a real problem. And then. You can look at it from another point of view. Okay, the slides are real. They're pictures of something. That does not mean they show an alien creature. The way to date the film, I think, if you take, and, I, and I've taken apart some of my older slides to look at the, at the way they're done, the dating code on the film doesn't appear on every slide. So it seems unlikely, but certainly possible, that you, if you pulled apart one of them, you get the date code for 1947, which I think is what they're claiming. And the, and the sleeves, like I said, put it in a range from 41 to 49 is when they use the, that particular cardboard sleeve. So you've got those problems. And I, I like I said, and I'm, I'm repeating myself now, I know it, but I just cannot see them overcoming those hurdles. And so when all is said and done, we're going to have a, we're going to have some interesting pictures of something that's not going to really prove anything. Now, when you have things like that, where you overpromise, you under the deliver, what happens to the UFO field in general? Do we just look crazier and crazier than we did before in terms of validity of what we have to say? I'm not sure that we can look any crazier. If you go back and you look at the history of the alien autopsy and who actually finally exposed it as being a hoax was, was members in the UFO field. But all anybody's going to remember is, well, we were, we were shown this autopsy film of this alien creature, and it turned out to be fake. And we look at this piece of metal that was going to be uh, proven to be of alien manufacture at the, at the Roswell Festival in 1997, and it turned out that it wasn't what it was promised to be. And so I think for a lot of people, it's going to be, well, yeah, we kind of expected that anyway, so no big deal. What people will remember is that the whole thing blew up. I mean, when the Air Force unveiled their idiotic Project Mogul explanation for the Roswell crash, you could see the reporters in the room weren't buying it. And now there's literally people say, oh, yeah, that was a, that was a balloon. And, and the evidence just does not support that conclusion. If you look at all the evidence, the, the, the Mogul flights do not explain what fell at Roswell. It doesn't mean it's alien or extraterrestrial. It just means this explanation doesn't work. But I think we're, we're going to end up here, I think, at this point, and, and the overhype may be the result of people like me the blogging about it, uh, unintentionally uh, raising the hype, although I tried to be very cautious 
in what I've said, and I've tried to be as neutral as possible in what I've said, but there's an awful lot of hype going on on other arenas, which if I was, if I was promoting this event, I'd be delighted about because it would put more money into my pocket. But I, I just think it's, it's going to turn out badly. And I find in the UFO field, when you shoot yourself in the foot, it really doesn't matter. As long as you embrace all the nonsense that's out there in the UFO field, <laughs> uh, you know, you've got to, you buy everything. You say, yes, it's all true. You validate people's belief structures. You're golden no matter what you've done in the past, what lies you've told in the past, what cases you've endorsed that have blown up in your face in the past. It doesn't matter as long as you're embracing the proper things in the UFO field. <laughs> it's the only field where people can blow their foot off and it grows back. <laughs> <laughs> they can blow their leg off and it grows back. <laughs> yeah, and it's amazing how some people are outed and they kind of duck out of a, a view for a while and then boom, they're back. And uh, like nothing happened. And, uh, you know, unless you knew about the uh, the outing or whatever the scenario was. Uh, I went through I went through piece by piece why Robert Willingham could not be believed. I presented the documentation. We had pictures of the guy. They said, well, we got pictures of a guy in his uniform, the Air Force uniform in the 1960s. He was he making the stuff up then. And I said, send me the pictures. And I looked at it. And the first thing I saw, it's a Civil Air Patrol uniform. It's not an Air Force uniform. There's another picture of him in his Class A blue uniform with his ribbons on, but the the insignia on the lapels, the U.S. that the Air Force would be wearing, is missing. And you can see the holes where he's taken it off, but he's wearing Civil Air Patrol ribbons along with his military ribbons, not all of which he earned, by the way. And so you know what he's done. He's, he's taken off the, the insignia, but he left the ribbons on. He can tell there's Civil Air Patrol ribbon. In the Civil Air Patrol, you are allowed to wear ribbons you earned on active duty. But you are not allowed to wear Civil Air Patrol ri ribbons on your active duty uniform if you're in the Air Force. So that makes it a Civil Air Patrol uniform. We look at the documentation. Well, here's where he's altered it. These, these notations make no sense. These are not proper notations. And people will say, well, you know, you've just circled the wagons and you just won't listen to the facts. Excuse me? I'm telling you what's going on here. I've shown you the evidence and you're telling me, no, this doesn't count. So uh, there's still people that argue for the legitimacy of Robert Willingham. Even though I found the original story he told in 1968 about his chase, his chase of the UFO and how it evolved into something completely different by the time he was interviewed in, in the late 90s and the, the beginning of this century. But people still believe Robert Willingham, and I'm the bad guy because I pointed it out. But I was more annoyed at him claiming to be a military officer than I was uh, his tale of a UFO crash. So the messenger is attacked. In the UFO field, obviously, the, mess the messenger is always the bad guy. If you suggest something isn't what it's supposed to be, you're the bad guy. Even though you can, you can demonstrate it through the evidence, um, and anybody who would check the evidence would see the same thing, you're the bad guy, and this guy's records have been altered because the government is covering up the great secret. Shades of Bob Lazar. Shades of Bob Lazar. Oh, uh, please. Mel Noel. Oh, yes, I remember that one, but I don't want to get into it. You know what? Let's, I'm going to ask you about Mel Noel in our next segment because we have talked about Lazar and the Paracast, but we'll get into that. Anyway, before you go on, please check plus.theparacast.com for information about the Paracast Plus, plus.theparacast.com. More with Kevin Randall and Gene and Chris. You're in the Paracast. <laughs> First came Attack of the Rockoids, and it was a critically acclaimed success. And now there is the coming of the Protectors. A former military intelligence man is contacted by a space woman in a dream. A dream that turns out to be a nightmare, because evil forces on our distant planet are planning to conquer the Earth. This is gripping science fiction of the classic kind. Attack of the Rockoids and the coming of the Protectors. Find out more at Rockoids.com. That's Rockoids, R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S, dot com. Do you need a website? Well, you can get a great deal on hosting services with Namecheap's legendary coupon code. They're offering substantial hosting discounts on shared hosting, business hosting, VPS hosting, reseller hosting, and even dedicated servers. Namecheap is preferred by millions. It's backed by a money-back guarantee. Use the coupon code LEGENDARY to cash in on the special deal at Namecheap.com, Namecheap.com. 
gold isn't for you? Ted Anderson, president of Midas Resources, one of the world's premier gold and precious metal investing firms. I get it. You wouldn't buy gold if you believed that the government is doing a great job, that the Fed will stop handing out trillions of dollars like bailout candy, that Social Security would be there for you. That's not what's happening. You might even pass on gold if the stimulus package wouldn't fuel inflation, or that the dollar wouldn't lose value, or that your retirement would be secure. If all looks rosy to you, then now is not the time to buy gold. For the realists, there have never been more sobering reasons to diversify with gold. Since 2001, the U.S. dollar index has tanked 30% while gold has risen 300%. Right now, savvy investors are adding gold to their portfolios. You should too. Find out what they know. Call us and I'll send you 10 reasons why gold will do very well, free. 800-686-2237. 800-686-2237. That's 800-686-2237. Did you know that drinking pure, high alkaline water is one of the most important factors in maintaining high energy and vibrant health? Most experts agree that the water you drink should be at a pH level of 8 or higher. AlkaVision Plasma pH Drops, available only at AlkaVision.com, combine a unique formula of only the most alkaline minerals. AlkaVision Plasma pH Drops alkalize your water, ridding the body of harmful toxins, and helps you regain health and energy. Alkalizing your water by simply adding 10 drops of AlkaVision Plasma pH Drops helps the body rid itself of acidic waste, increases oxygen content, and raises the pH of your body to healthy levels. And bacteria and viruses cannot survive in an alkaline high pH environment. Order your bottle of AlkaVision Plasma pH drops for only $29.95 at AlkaVision.com. That's A-L-K-A-Vision.com. Or call 269-409-1776. 269-409-1776. Alkalize your body. Supercharge your health at AlkaVision.com today. We live in a complicated society. Stressful issues are always popping up. Have you ever been treated unfairly by someone? Have you ever been overcharged for a repair? Have you ever signed a contract or a document? Worried about identity theft? How many times have you been in those unique situations where you just wanted to call an attorney to find out if you're right or wrong or what your legal rights are? But every time you think about calling an attorney, what do you think about first? That's right. Who do you call and how much will it cost? Our friends at Legal Shield have found a solution. With a nationwide network of 6,900 attorneys who average over 19 years of experience, Legal Shield's law firms take over 40,000 calls per week helping their members. For less than $20 per month, you can have access to Legal Shield on everything from the trivial to the traumatic. Let Legal Shield stand up for your rights at lsprotection.com. That's lsprotection.com. Or call 855-340-SAVE. 855-340-7283. Results will vary from case to case. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. Well, I guess we're just tearing apart the fakers, the hoaxers. We're talking about the vaporware and the UFO field. This event in Mexico City for Roswell Slides, May 5th. Is it going to be something important or another sideshow? Mel Noel, Kevin Randall, tell our listeners who he was. He was a guy who claimed to be an Air Force fighter pilot, signed to a special squadron that chased UFOs, made gun camera films of them. And he turned out not to have been a military officer, not to have been a fighter pilot. I mean, it's just the same story we hear over and over again. Uh, Another one is, I think, Bill English claimed to be a special forces captain and was involved in UFOs and actually told Don and me about the nun's diary. And I'm thinking, this guy's an ex-Green Beret, a special forces captain. I believe what he's saying. And we got his record and turned out, yes, he served in the Army. He was a PFC. It just goes on and on and on like that throughout the, the, the UFO field. Cliff Stone, say what you will about Cliff Stone. <laughs> he claimed to be in a sergeant first class in the Army, and he was. <laughs> claimed to have served in Vietnam, and the records bore that out. He served in Vietnam. <laughs> he was a clerk typist in Vietnam, but uh, he was still in Vietnam, set foot in country. Um, so, you know, at least with Cliff Stone, uh, he was telling the truth about his military record when he, when he talked about uh, having been in Vietnam and been a sergeant first class. There were other problems with his tales, but but that 
came out in other other investigations. But I mean, there are so many so many of these stories throughout the UFO field. It's just absolutely preposterous anymore. And I try to check these things out as much as I can. I, with the Willingham thing, I thought others had checked it out before me, and I, and I talked to Bruce Maccabee about it. And Bruce said, uh, uh, "Well, Todd Zeckel checked it out," and I'm thinking, "Well, if Zeckel checked it out, maybe I better do something too." But everybody thought somebody else had done it, so I went and did it again, and it turned out his records didn't it didn't line up with what he was saying. But we can check those records now. Um, Glenn Toy, a name you probably do not know who was involved in the sightings at White Sand Missile Range the day after the Level Land sightings in, in November of 1957, saw, saw an object with his, with his uh, partner. I checked him out. Glenn Toy is exactly who he said he was. Never made up any stories. Never, never, you know, he just has this wonderfully nice little UFO sighting in, uh, at, at White Sands Missile Range the day after. Actually, the, the, the same morning, but hours after the Level Land sightings had ended. But I checked it out, got his record. And he was exactly who he said he was. So some of them do check out, and, and, and some of them do not. Of course, even if they check out, no proof that that demonstrates the validity of their claims. Let's get back to Roswell shortly before we go to other subjects and lots of questions from our listeners. So the Dream Team book, not going to happen. No. We, we don't know about Roswell slides, but we have suspicions. Does that end it as far as Roswell research is concerned? Where can we possibly go from here, especially if the Roswell slides event is another uh, debacle? I have been looking at the at it as a cold case myself and looking at other things and uh, trying to put it all together. So I'm trying to put together the information into a book. We actually had an opportunity to sell sell the Roswell, the ultimate Roswell book, to a, a um, hardback, prestigious publishing house, but the window closed before we before we got done on all, all the investigation. If the slides blow up, it is not. I, I think the the thing is the slides. Um, and Tom and Don have, have kind of tried to do this, is distance the slides a little bit from the Roswell case. But if the slides blow up, it's just one more uh, <laughs> bump in the road, I guess. I mean, we've had the alien autopsy, which blew up. But there's a, there's a core of, of, of good, solid information there that has not blown up on us. Um, so we can continue to look at that. We're to the point where people who were assigned to the base in 1947 are no longer around to tell us what they saw or didn't see. Um, but we can look at, we can look at what has been said in the past and see how it all hangs together. And there's, there's some things that are going on uh, in the background that, that may uh, bear some fruit um, areas of investigation. People who, who, uh, you know, looking a little bit deeper into the backgrounds may provide some more information. So there may be some things going on that will help. But if if the slides blow up, it's going it's going to it's going to damage the Roswell case. It can't help to damage it because there's just one more example of somebody's trying to connect something to Roswell and it blew up. So it's it's going to damage that whole thing. But we have to look at the entirety of the UFO field, and everybody says, well, it began in June of 1947 with Arnold, but it really didn't. It began in the, late, in the early 1940s with the Foo Fighters in Europe, and we can see the connection with the Foo Fighters to the Ghost Rockets to an investigation that began unofficially in 1946 at Wright, Wright Field that evolved into Project Sign and an official investigation. So the history transcends Roswell. And, and there's some very good information going on there. And all, if all that comes forward, it helps, it helps the field as a whole and may help Roswell a little bit. But we're the, you know, we can't go back and talk to Walter Hott anymore. We can't talk to Jesse Marcel. We can't talk to Patrick Saunders. We can't talk to William Blanchard. We can't talk to Bill Brazel. I mean, all these people have since died. We've got some good stuff on tape. Both audio and videotapes from these people, so you can look at look at all of that. So you can you can kind of reinvestigate, but um, developing new information about it, unless somebody stumbles onto the file folder with some very good documentation in it, then then we're going to be um, kind of speculating from this point on. 
Speaking of speculations, are you aware of the claims made by the former international director of MUFON, James Carrion, about the ghost rockets being some kind of military disinformation thing? And I guess he's suggesting that Roswell might be something similar, although he hasn't come out with all the information yet. The problem with his theory is that if you look at the documentation from the embassies, and the people who are involved in it, and I'm thinking specifically Howard McCoy, um, they have nothing to do with it. It's not disinformation. The original idea was it was the Soviets trying to intimidate the Scandinavians with the ghost rockets, they'd be, with what they'd captured from the, from the Nazis after the end of World War II, and they were trying to intimidate um, specifically the Swedes. Uh, but there's no, there's no evidence in the files that have now been opened up after the collapse of the Soviet Union to support that conclusion. And the documentation really doesn't suggest that this was going on at the highest levels of the American uh, intelligence community to to either intimidate the Swedes or uh, as some kind of a disinformation ploy, because the guys who are involved in it, like Howard McCoy, are as puzzled as, as, as the rest of us. What's interesting, however, McCoy had gathered all this ghost rocket material, and once the investigation became public, all those records disappeared. He got rid of them. And my understanding is they're buried under the golf course at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Isn't everything? No, no, this was used for landfill. (laughs) We'll get into landfills and much more with Kevin Randall. I'm not serious. With Gene and Chris, you're in Paracast. Free from the shackles of corporate America, we're the place for independent thinkers. GCN. Graphic Converter is the image manipulation tool for the rest of us. It does not use any database. You get full control of all your files. Want to view the images of a folder? Drag it into Graphic Converter and a powerful browser opens up to show your image files. You could use it for slideshows. You could use it to import images from digital cameras or from scanners. Need to do some image editing? You can do that too in Graphic Converter. Also print catalogs. Convert from so many formats, I can't even list them. Download now to see if Graphic Converter is good for you, like one and a half million other users. Guess what? You could save money when you buy Graphic Converter. Use the coupon code NIGHTOWL. Use the coupon code NIGHTOWL to get a special price for Graphic Converter. Go to LemkeSoft.com. That's L-E-M-K-E Soft.com. LemkeSoft.com. L-E-M-K-E Soft.com. If you constantly feel run down and tired, your pH level might be low and your body could be full of toxins. If what you drink is not at a pH level of 8 or higher, you are inviting bacteria and acid to thrive in your body. But there is something you can do. Simply add 10 drops of AlkaVision Plasma pH drops to your water to help your body rid itself of acidic waste, increase oxygen, and raise your pH balance to optimum levels. AlkaVision Plasma pH drops combine a unique formula of the most alkaline minerals in the world. Alkalizing the water you drink, ridding your body of acidic waste and toxins, and helping you regain energy and vibrant health. And studies show viruses, bacteria, and toxins cannot survive in an alkaline, high pH environment. Order your bottle of AlkaVision Plasma pH drops at AlkaVision.com. That's A-L-K-A-Vision.com. Or call 269-409-1776. 269-409-1776. Alkalize your body. Supercharge your health at AlkaVision.com today. By now, you may have heard a bit about Bitcoins. But did you know Bitcoins are now over an $8.5 billion market? And did you know that over 65,000 businesses now accept Bitcoins? Listen, if you're already earning Bitcoins or trying to make money in the Bitcoin market, you've got to know BidBit.co. Why? Because BidBit.co is where you can easily receive Bitcoins by selling and auctioning off your own personal items or promote business products and services for Bitcoins. You heard right. Whether personal or business, you can now buy, sell, and 
auction your products and services quickly, easily, and securely for Bitcoin at BidBit.co, the first and only marketplace website to offer BidBit escrow, a proprietary technology which gives buyers and sellers security and peace of mind because all transactions are protected. Start today. It's free to join, free to post, free to auction, and free to bid at BitBit.co. Buy, sell, bid, or auction everything Bitcoin. That's www.bidbit.co. BidBit.co. Don't complain about your cable bill going up and up and up. Do something about it. Grab a pencil and jot down this special number. 1-855-905-MY-TV. The more cable TV rates go up, the better digital satellite TV looks. Say goodbye to the cable guy. And get more of your favorite channels in 100% digital quality for less money. Call 1-855-905-MY-TV. Sign up for packages starting as low as $19.99 and there's no equipment to buy. You get free HD TV upgrade, a free DVR upgrade, and free professional and installation you control what you watch when you watch it record your favorite shows pause and rewind live tv even skip the commercials watch local channels too at just $19.99 what are you waiting for pull out your major credit or debit card call 1-855-905-MY-TV 1-855-905-MY-TV say goodbye to the cable guy cut costs and get more 1-855-905-MY-TV 1-855-905-MY-TV This is Kurt Seven, the author of UFO Mysteries, and you're listening to the Paracast. Okay, Kevin and Randall, we're discussing Roswell and now ghost rockets with Gene and Chris. Now, I think the theory that I read in the Rosetta Deception from Carry On was that we were trying to spook the Russians yeah. in doing this stuff with ghost rockets, but you don't think he's made the case. No, I don't think he's made the case, and I think the documentation, when you look at all the documentation, especially that, that um, comes comes out from what Howard McCoy was doing, it, it kind of suggests that the theory is inaccurate. You know, I don't, I don't, the evidence is not there to support the theory. You know, it's an interesting idea, and, and there are some things about the ghost rockets that are extremely puzzling. But, you know, I look at the information that's been developed by the, the, the Swedish UFO researchers, and I discuss it. I discuss it at length in the government UFO files, uh, but it, it's just suggestive of it having nothing to do with a disinformation campaign or attempt to spook the Soviets. And you, you, and then you look at the crash on Spitsbergen Island, and uh, what's going on there, and you find out that this is you know that's really kind of a hoax and has nothing to do with UFOs whatsoever. So there's all these things going on, but I don't think it's really disinformation ploys from. Uh, from the United States, and I don't think it was the Soviets attempting to intimidate the Swedish government, and I really don't know what it was. You know, a lot of the things were, were seen to kind of explode in the air, and a lot of them seemed to crash, but they never seemed to recover any debris that would explain exactly what it was. You know, so there's, there's some problems with um, with, the, with these theories. So I, you know, Carrion's got an interesting idea, but I don't think I don't think um, the documentation supports it. Chris, we've got loads and loads of questions from our listeners. Of Kevin we Randall. do, and I think uh, this first question um, is uh, appropriate for the where we are in this conversation. Uh, this comes from Sublight, who is a one of our new signees at uh, forum.theparacast.com, where you can post questions for our guests. Mr. Randall, why, after all these years, is so much attention placed on Roswell and so little attention has been given to the 1947 saucer wave itself? During that, that same summer, there are so many detailed accounts of people who saw these things. It's always frustrated me that so much time has been sucked into Roswell, and I feel that we've lost a lot of information we could have gained by interviewing people over the last 30 or 40 years about what they saw during that same summer. And perhaps uh, we could get more details or more information, or we could have uh, comments about that. That's a good point. There were an amazing amount of sightings during that summer of 47, which has kind of been lost uh, in the shuffle over the years. Well, if you take a look at uh, what Ted Blocher's uh, monograph, the, the wave of 1947, you get an awful lot of that information. You can, you can go to your newspaper files and look the stuff up yourself. One of the things that I did as I was doing the uh, government UFO files is I was looking for any sightings of discs that were reported prior to Kenneth Arnold because, you know, the, the theory is 
the idea of a flying saucer was born out of a mistake that one of the reporters made when, when Arnold said that he, the, 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 the craft moved like saucers skipping across the water. They described them as disc-shaped objects or flying saucers, and you know this was a misnomer. So I was looking for sightings of, of discs that were reported prior to Arnold. One of the things they pointed out to, and it's something that anybody can do, was a sighting in Cedar Rapids, Iowa on June 23rd of a, of a railroad man. I don't remember if he was an engineer or a conductor or what exactly what he was, but he'd seen 10 disc-shaped objects, disc-shaped objects in the sky. And you look at Frank Edwards' work, and he's mentioned it, and I think uh, Wendy Connors in their book about uh, Alfred Loading, which examines a lot of the 47 stuff, references to Frank Edwards, Richard Hall and his UFO evidence mentioned the case and dated it off of June 23, 1947. So I said, well, Cedar Rapids, Iowa, I'm going to go look at the newspaper. I finally found the case. It took place at best on the same day as the Arnold sighting. It wasn't reported till days later. It didn't take place in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. It took place in Joliet, Illinois. And so I chased that story down because it, it would have been a disc shaped, a sighting of disc shaped objects reported prior to Arnold. It turned out not to be true. The point being is we haven't lost the opportunity. A lot of that research has been done. A lot of it is in, especially the older UFO books. So you can go back and look at that stuff. You can go back to the newspaper files. You can find people for, who are around in 1947 who remember this stuff and you can look the whole you can you can look it all up so a lot of that work has been done and it's out there you just have to assemble it yourself uh but one of the first places to start would be ted blocher's uh the wave uh, of 1947 and it's available for free online you just type ted blocher's name and uh the ufo wave from 1947 and you'll get to that and you, it, there's a wonderful resource that provides that sort of information so i don't think we've lost it we focused on Roswell because if Roswell turns out to be true, if Roswell was a crash as an alien craft, then we prove the case and we can, we can stop arguing about whether they're alien visitation or not. We can now move on to other arenas of investigation. That's why Roswell has taken over the, the majority of the research. But the, the other research you want is out there. It's, it's printed in the books. It's printed in the newspapers. It's out there for the person who wants to look for it. Now, I understand the value of Roswell evidence of alien life, evidence of alien technology. But if we've reached the end point in getting new evidence, we've reached the point where there's not much more to be found unless some real smoking gun, and I have my doubts about Roswell slides, is found. Let me just add something here that uh, uh, may be of interest, I think, to Kevin and yourself and, and our listeners. A friend of the show, Ron Regeer, has been putting the finishing touches on I guess the working title is another damn book about Roswell. <laughs> Some of the things that I've discussed with him about his work uh, is very intriguing and could possibly be considered new evidence about this case. A lot of this has to do with the actual photographs taken uh, of uh, Jesse Marcel and the uh, you know supposed uh, mogul balloon wreckage and uh, also uh, General Ramey. Um, the photographs also show him and the note in his hand. There's been some forensic uh, analysis work done on that particular note that he has in his hand. And Ron McGuire has uncovered from the Bettman archives a very interesting photograph that appears to show the Roswell wreckage. But it, it, it looks like it's uh, much thicker in this particular photograph uh, that was uncovered out of the Bettman archive. And he also has some other uh, interesting uh, tidbits that he's going to have in there, and I don't want to steal his thunder on it. But uh, rest assured, I think it's going to uh, raise some eyebrows. Um, he has uh, gone about this in, in a, this whole thing in a new and sort of forensic sort of manner, which um, I applaud. And um, he's been doing some very good work, and I'm really excited to to uh, see the results of this work. Uh, I believe the book will be published by Keyhole uh, Publishing, uh, Richard Dolan's uh, publishing company, and uh, I'm pretty excited about this. This is uh, this could be uh, some pretty interesting additional information that uh, that has not been considered yet. So rest assured that there is still a little bit left out there. I think uh, about this case that uh, is uh, new and um, and could possibly be bombshell material. 
You know what? We have to bring Ron back on the show. Bring him over to your house so we can get a decent connection for the show. Because last time we had Ron on, it was a wonderful episode. He's really a great guy. He's just a lot of fun to talk to. I met him for the first time over at the International UFO Conference. And we have to... I was helping him with his MacBook, by the way. And he just needs to use Skype or something to make that connection. And let's talk about it further. Have you heard anything of this, Kevin? I No, I have not. But the point simply is that there are places to go and research that can be done that may provide additional information. I'll no, grant that. we got more questions from listeners, by the way, to get to. I just want to tell you again that we have that second radio show after the Paracast, which is kind of a color commentary thing. But sometimes we carry over the content from this show to after the Paracast when we need more time to talk about it, like last week with our Shop Talk 2015 episode with Burnt State, one of our active forum members. We all reconvened at After the Powercast to find out more about the Powercast Plus. Go to plus.thepowercast.com, P-L-U-S dot thepowercast.com. We have Kevin Randall with us this week with Gene and Chris. You're in the Powercast. <laughs> Not just an alternative to the mainstream media. We're the premier independent talk radio network. We are GCN. First came Attack of the Rockoids, and it was a critically acclaimed success. And now there's the coming of the Protectors. A former military intelligence man is contacted by a space woman in a dream. A dream that turns out to be a nightmare, because evil forces on our distant planet are planning to conquer the Earth. This is gripping science fiction of the classic kind. Attack of the Rockoids and the coming of the Protectors. Find out more at rockoids.com. That's rockoids, R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S, dot com. So here's what happened. I was placing an order online. The site went down. It took hours before it returned, but I had already placed the order with another company. If your site goes down, you could lose business. And if you have a business or personal site, you'll want to know it's easy to run and it will stay online. At iWeb, your site is hosted on one of the most reliable networks in the world. Talk to a sales rep at iWeb.com. Use the promo code TechNightOwl for a special discount. Don't complain about your cable bill going up and up and up. Do something about it. Grab a pencil and jot down this special number. 1-855-905-MY-TV. The more cable TV rates go up, the better digital satellite TV looks. Say goodbye to the cable guy. And get more of your favorite channels in 100% digital quality for less money. Call 1-855-905-MY-TV. Sign up for packages starting as low as $19.99 and there's no equipment to buy. You get free HD TV upgrade, a free DVR upgrade, and free professional and installation you control what you watch when you watch it record your favorite shows pause and rewind live tv even skip the commercials watch local channels too at just $19.99 what are you waiting for pull out your major credit or debit card call 1-855-905-MY-TV 1-855-905-MY-TV say goodbye to the cable guy cut costs and get more 1-855-905-MY-TV 1-855-905-MY-TV Attention taxpayers, if you've received a notice from the IRS or state, do not ignore it. It's also a big mistake to try and handle your tax problem on your own. If you owe back taxes, it's a fact that the government has the power to take everything you own, including your home, business, wages, savings, and your freedom. But here's the good news. There's a special toll-free tax hotline set up especially for you. This tax hotline will tell you about new programs that are geared to help you dramatically settle, reduce, or eliminate what you owe. But you have to call now. Take down this number or put it in your cell phone. But call 877-345-7645. That's 877-345-7645. Three four five seventy six forty five. When you call, you get free information on how you can reduce or eliminate back taxes, including penalties and interest. You can also be helped if you have unfiled returns, a tax lien, wage garnishment, bank levy, or if you've been entered into a payment plan but can't make the payments. Don't make the big mistake in thinking you can ignore or handle your tax problem on your own. You can stop the collection process immediately at one 345 7645 That's one 345 7645 one 345 7645 There's 
man named Dr. Joel Wallach, who is anything but your typical doctor, both a veterinarian and naturopathic physician. Doc asks, why does the United States spend more money on health care by far and still rank 50th in health and longevity worldwide? He believes that people should empower themselves with a basic understanding of nutrition, take charge of their health, and attain optimal health and longevity through nutrition, not by toxic prescription drugs that lead to side effects and more toxic prescription drugs. Doc Wallach's message is resonating with an increasing number of Americans who are waking up to all the big government, big pharma, and big insurance manipulation of our health care system. I'm George Norrie, and I like what Doc Wallach is saying and doing to enlighten people about health care. Visit brightsideben.com and listen to Doc Wallach's Deadly Recipes lecture. It makes a lot of sense, and I urge you to join the Brightside Ben team. Go to brightsideben.com. That's brightsideben.com. This is Jerome Clark, author of the UFO Encyclopedia and other books. You're listening to the Paracast. We have Kevin Randall joining us. Chris O'Brien, we've got some more questions from listeners. I do. Uh, speaking of Burnt State, our good friend, who's uh, one of our posters at forum.theparacast.com, who's actually passed the 3,000 post mark uh, recently. And that was and only yesterday. Yeah, <laughs> probably. Well, he's got uh, another post here for us. And, um, it, you know, I, I think a good one to start with is this one. Historically, what investigators and theorists to date have provided some positive critical direction regarding the UFO phenomenon, and who do you feel is currently leading the investigation in an innovative manner? What techniques and methods do you feel will help to shed light on this enduring problem? Wow. I don't even know where to begin. Good Lord. Um, what I found is I've done, I've done something what I call chasing footnotes. And you look at how something is footnoted in a book and you chase it to the foot to, to what is referenced to what is referenced to see if you can get to the original source material. And then it provides you with some interesting insights into what was going on. I suppose if you're going to be honest about this, if you're looking for the, you, the leaders in the UFO field, you have to start with Stan Friedman, who wins the title simply by longevity. Um, you have to look at Tom and Don are doing their thing and trying to, to get to the bottom of the case, and they're looking at a lot of stuff. George Filer, with his Filer files, provides a lot of information, but I don't think he screens it critically. I think he just publishes what he gets, which is kind of the Len Stringfield way of doing it, is I've got this information, I can't do anything with it, but here it is, maybe you can learn something about it, and let me know what you find out, and we'll update it as we go along. You know, I know the Center for UFO Studies is not functioning at top speed. They had to eventually give up on the IUR. You know, so I, I, if you want to look at the investigation, I, I, I focus on the nuts and bolts stuff. Um, there's people doing a lot of work on abductions. Uh, you know, that's something else. You've got people looking at cattle mutilations. You've got people who are interested in landing traces and following that stuff up. Um, Ted Phillips has got that investigation going on in Missouri, which is more of a uh, spook-like phenomenon than it is an um, alien visitation type thing, but it's interesting and nonetheless. Uh, so there's a lot of that stuff going on. And I, you know, there's, I guess you could say the UFO field is like any discipline where there's a lot of subsets to it, and you just find the subset that, that interests you. Uh, I, I didn't mention crop circles. Uh, there's people who are very interested in crop circles and what they're doing. So uh, you just have to find the people in that field who are doing the work that you are interested in. Uh, I, I was looking at um, John Mack's work because of his credentials. You know, Bud Hopkins was doing some interesting stuff, uh, but but you know we've lost both of them, and so that's kind of fallen off the rails and i i don't see a lot of, of about abductions like we used to i don't know but but i don't actively search that sort of thing out so i guess that kind of is an answer to the question sort of maybe 
What about the idea of real-time hard data monitoring of triangulated camera arrays, magnetometer, gravitometer type gear uh, in concert with uh, triangulated uh, optical? Let's do it. Let's do it. That's yeah. wonderful. In today's environment, you can set it up through the Internet. That's a wonderful idea. Let's do it. I also remember back back in the early days of Blue Book, um, Ed Ruppel talked about putting out cameras, especially with the with the green fireballs over um, the desert southwest. And he said, well, we never got the cameras there, and they never took any photographs. But if you take a look at some of the documentation that comes out of the green fireballs, and granted this is the 1940s again, early 1950s, there was a picture taken. But I don't know where it went. I don't know what happened to it. And and so that's some that's one of the other things you need to go into the archives. You need to look at the look at the documentation and see where that leads you today too. But but in, you know, if you can set up some kind of triangulation back in the back in the 1960s when I lived in Colorado, um, the Denver UFO Society had tried to set something up like that, and and they had um, a sort of a, a phone tree around the the Denver metropolitan area, which was quite huge for those of you who don't know Denver. And and I think we got actually one phone call about an object in the sky somebody had spotted, and we went out and looked, and, and in fact it was a weather balloon. But the point is, you know, that sort of thing has been attempted in the past, but in today's environment with instant communications, um, right, and affordable the, technology. Yes, and, and I mean, good lord, my cell phone, but has a 13 megapixel camera on it for God's sakes. Um, so I mean, it. it, it that something can be done. You can do it through Skype. You can do it with the internet. You could just set something wonderful up, and and might be able to get some very dramatic evidence that way. Yeah. Well, that that leads us to a question by one of our friendly skeptics uh, who has returned to the forum uh, after a long absence. Uh, Angel of, I don't know how you had. Is it Lauren? I'm not sure how to. We just call him Angelo. That's his. Real well, it's name. Angelo. Yeah, but okay. uh, his his avatars of Mario. Uh, the the video game character. Well, you know, since we're talking about technology, we're talking about cameras, uh, cell phones, that sort of thing. His question is a good one. Despite the fact that everyone has HD video cameras with them now, UFO sightings are rarely caught on video. It seems as though overall UFO sightings have actually gone down. I feel as though this is due to the fact that people are more informed now about what in the world they are they are seeing uh, when the most famous sightings did happen. Also, if they do capture something, be it an image or video, that image is often clear, and one can tell that they caught a bird or a conventional aircraft or whatever. Do you feel that it's strange that with so many cameras out there, Kevin, we've got nothing concrete? I think the problem goes beyond that. And I think it's the problem that that, that any 12-year-old kid with a computer can now fake a stunning video, yeah, and, and there's really no way to tell. Yeah, the, uh, well, there, there there are ways to tell, but uh, not the average person. I don't think is equipped. But, but, but that, the, the problem is, it's very easy to fake something like this. I also think about it. Um, a lot of the images that are captured uh, are, are we've got the pictures of fireballs, for example, crossing crossing multiple states, and and the difference is they're literally 50, 60 miles high. UFOs, if you're looking at them, they're much lower, so you ha you don't have as much opportunity to catch them, uh, catch them on, on the camera. Yes, it is disturbing that there is not good cell phone video of, of something. And But when well, I, look at, I look at some of the things from the 1950s, the film, which would make it very, very difficult. It was very difficult to take that stuff. Um, how they have been they have been belittled and ignored simply because they don't they don't resolve into a disc shaped craft uh, like you would like them to to but but you don't um, but but you still got them being belittled and the and the other the ans I guess the ancillary problem is we do not seem to be getting the same sort of robust UFO sightings that we got in the the the, the 40s and the 50s and the 60s. And it might be partially because we are more sophisticated. We can we are identifying things that we would have said was a UFO, uh, you know, 30 years ago. We're saying, oh yeah, well that was an airplane, or that was a bird, or something like that. Or it may be that that the number of sightings is down simply because we're not being visited as frequently as we used to be. Well, people kinds of people are looking at their their cell phones and falling in love with their thumbs. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. 
uh, what was the movie? The the internship, and they're they're standing there at the Golden Gate Bridge, and the guy's looking at his cell phone, and and uh, Owen Wilson walks over and lifts his chin up and says, "Look at the view." You know, you don't need to look at your cell phone. Look at the view you've got here, and 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 that may be a problem too. We're so busy looking at our cell phones, we're not looking up in the sky to see bizarre things. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think it's uh, it's it's a major problem. Uh, people ask me. You know, I've had quite a number of, I think, bona fide uh, quality sightings in the San Luis Valley, and and people have kind of gone up to me in a very accusing sort of way and said, "Well, how come you see so many things and 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 I don't?" And I said, "Because I look." <laughs> yeah, that's precisely the answer too. <laughs> you I mean, have to look. Answer. Let me just mention this because we have to break it a second. This might be interesting. And there's this new product out from Apple called Apple Watch, where it becomes an accessory to like an iPhone. And the big thing that's being touted about it in the reviews is the fact that instead of looking at your smartphone and devoting so much attention to it, and one writer says people do that like 100 times a day, smartphones, you just glance at the watch very quickly to get a notification of something or it gives you a, a taptic message on your wrist and you get the message quickly and get back to your business. So instead of looking at your smartphone all day, you maybe have the casual glance at your Apple Watch and then maybe you look up to the skies and maybe you see something. I don't know if Apple's going to solve the problem, but that's uh, the theory anyway. Chris O'Brien and Gene with Kevin Randall, you're in the Paracast. We are the premier independent talk radio network. The Genesis Communications Network. G-C-N. Good people need help. The Homeowners Association said we had weeds and fined us $25. We told them they had the wrong house. They said if we didn't pay it, they'd file a lien. Our attorney demanded photographs, witnesses, and told them if they couldn't provide this, they must cease and desist. Issue solved. Worry less and live more with LSProtection.com. That's LSProtection.com or call 855-340-SAVE. That's 855-340-7283. Results will vary from case to case. We the people grow cotton, weave fabric, engrave ink, embed strips and fibers to protect from counterfeit, then carding to a private bank, having it lent back at interest, forcing taxes to service debt. This capitalism, or was Jefferson correct when stating a central bank issuing the public currency is a greater menace to the liberties of the people than a standing army? Hi, Ted Anderson. I'm placing a free silver dollar in a book that explains our monetary system. Call for your copy, 800-686-2237. It's time to understand the system. Call 800-686-2237. That's 800-686-2237. It's time to build your own emergency food stockpile with the industry leader, My Patriot Supply. Once you try them, you'll know why so many Americans like you have made them part of their emergency preparedness plan. Experience the My Patriot Supply difference today with this unbelievable offer. Right now, a four-week food supply is only $99, and that includes free shipping. That's 50% off the online price. Call 800-274-3070 to claim yours. Limit two per caller while supplies last. This offer isn't available online, so you want to make sure and grab this opportunity to get prepared today. 800-274-3070 to get your four-week food supply for the incredible price of only $99, and it'll be shipped to you completely free. Call 800-274-3070 right now. That's 800-274-3070 to claim yours while supplies last. Don't wait. Call today. Welcome back to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. You see, the Apple Watch is going to solve the UFO mystery, Kevin Randall. Can you dig it? Yes, I can. Yes, I can. (laughs) But you need $349 and up to buy one, and they've got one for $17,000. Um, oh, oh my! Yeah, I and I look at my house. I've got like five computers. In, 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 <laughs> you have to keep updating your computer to stay yeah. alert. I know that um, feeling. Five computers. You know, I feel out of sorts here. We have two iPhones, one iPad, which is a computer. It's a personal computer. 
But then you can say the same thing about iPhones nowadays. They are personal yeah. computers. I have an old MacBook Pro and an iMac. See, and I've got, I've got an iPad. I've actually got the computer that I took to Iraq with me 10 years ago, and it's still working. Way to go, Sony. And I've got, I've got, a, I've got an old IBM computer, you know, an old power computer, which has the computing power of virtually nothing. <laughs> Today's iPhone has about 10 times the computing power of an old IBM tower. Well, we can go, we can look at it from another way. And back in Star Trek, they had their stupid communicators and they didn't get a lot of information for my compute, my, my iPhone, or actually my, my smartphone is better than the Star Trek communicator. I have the entire knowledge of the human race in the palm of my hand on my, um, on my smartphone. But yeah. do you think with a smartwatch, the point is to get your information in a glance? Yeah, and that's it. I just kind of glance at it. Supposedly, it's asleep until you raise your hand. And sometimes it doesn't work. You got to flick your hand, they tell me. And you look at it and you see your notice. And then you can dismiss it, get on with your business. Or if it requires your attention, you give it. Still, I don't think it's going to increase UFO sightings. I think our minds are elsewhere. I don't think people care as much about UFOs or the possibilities. Yet, when you look at all the stories these days, maybe there's liquid water under Mars and on some of the moons of Saturn and Jupiter and maybe even on Mercury. And in 10 or 20 years, we'll have proof of extraterrestrial life. Is or that more, paving the way for a revelation that's here now? Or more importantly, we just got the first color photographs of Pluto today from the... Ah. They just announced that it's not a really good photograph and it's blurry, but my God, it's the first color photographs of Pluto. I think, I think if you find life, regardless of whether it is now extinct or it is microscopic on Mars, you've proven that there would be extraterrestrial life and we've, taken, we, we've made it easier to accept the idea of alien visitation. If you go back to the 60s when they were talking about uh, Project Ozma and you know, factoring in life throughout the universe looking for the sign signals of, of other radio civilizations. And at that time, we didn't know whether or not the, the solar system was unique, our solar systems rare, or do all stars have systems? And, and today we, we know of what thousands of extrasolar planets. So we've, we've taken a step closer to that by, by demonstrating that our system is not unique or our system is not rare, but it seems the majority of the stars have some kind of planetary system around no. them. So you've, you've increased the likelihood. And, and as we move out and learn more things, we're increasing the likelihood. It becomes more believable, more easily accepted that there's alien visitation as we learn more about the, 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 the solar system around us and the galaxy around us and the universe around us. Please notice yeah. how I, I move from the smallest, the solar system, to the galaxy, to the universe. I did it in a logical progression. Yeah. No I, relevance just, to that. I just wanted to point that out. It's a very good point. And I, I, I think I just read uh, the last day or two a new estimate of how many planets uh, are thought now to uh, be in our galaxy alone. And it's 40 billion planets well, are, they're estimating now are in the Milky Way. Uh, just one galaxy out of billions of galaxies so we don't even know we don't even know how many planets are in our own solar system yeah. <laughs> explain that more to our listeners because that gets to be kind of murky because we have dwarf planets are they when i was growing up we had nine planets yeah but that was like 1830 no in 1830 we had we had like eight planets okay i'm kidding and then, and then they discovered more and at one point i think we had 12 but then they discovered some of the asteroids were just really not planets. And then we, we finally settled after, after Tom Baugh discovered Pluto. We, we, we settled on nine. Then uh, what's-his-face Tyson decided Pluto didn't deserve to be a planet. <laughs> so we created dwarf planets and we were back to eight. But now there's talk about if you go to what um, Kuiper Belt, the Kuiper Belt, trans-Neptune objects, you go to that, they're talking about there being one or two or three uh, planets out there that may be as large as Mars or Earth or even larger. So there may, be, there may be planets we haven't discovered circling the sun out in the Kuiper belt that are so far away that they might as well be in another solar system. Yeah, it's, it's a big universe out there. And 
like you pointed out, we don't even really know the full extent of what <laughs> exists in our own solar system here. So it's uh, I, I think it's going to it's going to as as science uh, takes leaps and, and bounds forward and the technology and our capabilities to utilize that technology becomes more sophisticated. Uh, it's it's amazing what uh, humans, uh, when they set their mind to it, what they can discover and, and determine about about the reality that we're all existing within. So, you know, I think science is on the right track in many ways. But then you look at a program like SETI, which is uh, trying to find out if there's radio stations being uh, broadcast uh, out there by ET. You have to scratch your head and wonder <laughs> – if yeah, maybe isn't they're that, uh, isn't that twentieth century technology, guys? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> should we be looking a little bit more advanced than that? And what, yeah, if, what, really. if, what if the civilizations? What if they uh, are telepathic and they never invented radio? Well, well maybe cousin Brucey, who is still alive and still doing radio shows, is really from Tau Ceti. Well, all I'll say about that is, can you get him off the serious radio? Because every time I, it seems like every time I turn it on, he's, he's blabbing about something. I want to listen to music, not Cousin Brucey reminiscing about the good old days. Uh, he just seems to go on and on incoherently. <laughs> this is on Sirius Channel 6. That's 60s music. <laughs> it's not, only, yeah. not unlike us now. <laughs> and you've got, of course, Peter Noon, Ehrman of Herman's Hermits. And he does a pretty good show. He tells really good stories. And has a, this pleasant charisma, so it's fun to listen to. But Cousin Brucey just throws on and on and on. And let's talk about the gradual acceptance I see here of life in outer space. Would that be another way, and it's a conspiracy theory, to ultimately admit that, yeah, we're being visited right now? I think if you, if you demonstrate the feasibility of, of life on other planets, you make the case for alien visitation that much easier. Doesn't prove that there's alien visitation. Doesn't prove that that technology is going to be able to overcome the vast distances among the various stars. And when you start talk about galaxies, I mean what our nearest galaxy is what, two point five million light years away? I mean that's a long time to be traveling. But warp you, drive or stargates. But that's only operating inside our own solar, our own galaxy. It's not getting us to other galaxies. Well, I gather with Stargate, they went between galaxies. Well, <laughs> you just got to love sci-fi. <laughs> I'm not going to argue the point because we're all a fan of, of, of Stargate. You know, anyhow, um, when you look at evidence that there's life developing on other worlds in other ways, even if it's inside our own solar system, you've you've opened the door to life developing on planets in other solar systems, and it makes the acceptance of the idea a little easier than when we when we look at Earth and say life is unique to Earth, um, and we don't see evidences of it elsewhere. If we see evidences of it elsewhere, well, it makes it easier to accept that idea. But is that deliberate, or just that's what happens? I think it's just that's what happens. I don't think there's anything deliberate about it. I think if you take a look at the attitudes of people today as opposed to people in the 1960s, I mean, if you look at um, the science fiction of the 1960s, they're just talking about you know, the, first, the first people on moon, uh, getting to the moon. Or if you look at what Forbidden Planet in the, in the narration that begins that movie, they say that, that, that we reached the moon at the end of the 21st century. You know, uh, let's go into more of this in our next segment. With Kevin Randall and Gene and Chris, you're in the Paracast. <laughs> Neighbors, are you tired of dealing with a slow web hosting provider? Well, check out A2 Hosting and their screaming fast Swift server platform. They even have SSDs that load pages 300% faster than the competition. Ready to give your site a speed boost? Well, tell you what, neighbors, head on over to a2hosting.com. That's A2, that's number two, a2hosting.com. Check out their Prime Hosting account. And get this, neighbors, they're even giving you an exclusive 25% off discount for all our listeners. 25%. And remember, their Guru Crew support team is standing by 24-7, 365 days a year to answer any of your questions. Now, to get the discount, use the coupon code GENE 
when you check out. Friends, this is Alex Jones for MidasResources.com. For more than 15 years, I have exclusively used Midas Resources for all my precious metal needs. Whether it's bullion or collectibles you're looking for, Midas Resources is simply the best. I own my gold as a hedge against inflation. This Federal Reserve fiat currency could go the way of the Deutschmark and the Weimar Republic anytime. In these historically dangerous times, it makes sense to physically hold gold and silver. Midas already has some of the best deals in the industry. But if you give them a call and mention the radio special, they will give you a list of the day's super specials. Midas brokers are standing by to answer all your questions at 800-686-2237. They also have a lot of informative free literature explaining the opportunities and risk of holding precious metals. They are ready to answer your questions at 800-686-2237. Again, that's 800-686-2237. Right now is the time to jumpstart your health with a new 30% discount from InfoWarsHealth.com. Secure the all-new Tangy Tangerine 2.0 with certified organic ingredients that are non-GMO and better tasting than ever for an exclusive 30% off discount when you sign up at InfoWarsHealth.com. That's 30% off retail when you become a distributor at InfoWarsHealth.com. You've heard me talk about Tangy Tangerine for years now, and you've heard others talk about what it's done for them. Take the challenge, try it for the first time, or even Reorder your Tangy Tangerine and other great longevity products like Pollen Burst or the Alex Pack, all for 30% off when you visit InfoWarsHealth.com. This is a fantastic opportunity to be able to try out the hundreds of amazing products at InfoWarsHealth.com and get 30% off on products like Beyond Tangy Tangerine 2.0. Visit InfoWarsHealth.com to get started today. You can also sign up for auto ship and get free shipping. 30% off and free shipping. It's all available exclusively at InfoWarsHealth.com today. We all know that Berkey Water Purification Systems are the most trusted name in water filtration. As an authorized Berkey dealer for over six years and serving thousands of satisfied customers, the Berkey Guy offers amazing specials for Berkey Water Filtration Systems. The Berkey Light Systems include a set of self-sterilizing and recleanable black purification elements that purify water by removing chlorine, pathogenic bacteria, cysts and parasites to non-detectable levels and remove harmful chemicals such as herbicides and pesticides. Order the Berkey Light Systems system today complete with two black Berkey elements for only $231 and the Berkey guy will ship your order free of charge. With the purchase of a Berkey light, the Berkey guy is also offering a set of fluoride and arsenic filters for only $39.99. That's over 30% off the retail price. Call the Berkey guy at 1-877-886-3653. That's 1-877-886-3653 or order online at goberkey.com. That's goberkey.com today. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. IS Forbidden Planet, when Leslie Nielsen was a serious actor. And that was interesting. I remember that. And this was... Really, 1956, in the 60s, we already have the promise of landing a man or a human being on the moon before 1970. If you look at Forbidden Planet, they, you know, they, they mentioned the end of the 21st century. But 13 years later, from the you know, release of the movie, we've got people on the moon. And we put, if, if we really wanted to de dedicate the resources to it, we could have put people on Mars 20 years ago. But the, the, the point simply is that as our science evolves and our science fiction evolves in the same direction, it makes the exception of some of these ideas simpler. So I think the people who grew up in the last 20 years are more accepting of the idea of alien life forms than the people in the 50s or the 40s were because of, of what our, how our knowledge is expanded. Does the presence of UFOs give us the vision for a future where humans are space-faring people? If we're getting visited by aliens, yeah, certainly. Whatever uh, the cause, but it, the it, mere it, presence gives you that feeling. Once you know something is possible, it's much easier for you to do it than if you think it's impossible. Because if you think it's impossible, you don't even try. 
But if you think it's possible, you find out a way to do it. I think that if we're, you know, there's alien visitation, well, obviously interstellar travel is possible. Now all we have to do is figure out how to do it, as opposed to saying, well, it's impossible. We're not even going to even try to do it. Um, and we've actually come up with ways of doing interstellar travel, but it, it it's not beyond the speed of light. You know, the speed of light is the limiting factor, as far as we know. And so, if you if you take off for the nearest star system, which is four light years away, it could take you literally hundreds of years to get there, given our current technology. But if we figure out the way to either short circuit the distances or a way of traveling faster than the speed of light, then we change we change the whole dynamic. But if you and if you've got people or alien creatures coming here, and you look at it, uh, you say, well, interstellar flight is possible. How how can they be doing that? And you start looking for ways to doing it, rather than saying, well, we, it's impossible, so we're not even going to try. Doesn't then the existence of UFOs inspire the imagination if you take it the least bit seriously? I would think so, and I would think SETI would want to look at at it. You know, you know SETI is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Well, you know, if they're coming here, you found them, guys. Now let's figure out something else. Uh, but SETI won't even look at the UFOs. They want they want nothing to do with UFOs. Yeah. NASA, you would think NASA would be excited about UFOs, but. NASA, I think it was the Clinton administration, tried to get NASA to investigate UFOs. They didn't want to get anywhere near it. And I think part of the problem is what we have done inside the UFO community. And when I say we, I'm thinking of of all the things from the contactees to all the hoaxes that have been perpetrated and all of that sort of nonsense that goes on to the legitimate look at UFOs. You look at the Condon Committee, and their job was to end the Air Force investigation. It wasn't to investigate flying saucers. It wasn't to find out what was going on. It was to end the Air Force participation in UFO investigations, which they did. And you still have scientists pointing it to it today, saying, you know, well, the Condon Committee showed there was nothing to it. Well, no, they really didn't show that. They showed it was not a threat to national security, and the Air Force shouldn't be investigating them, and that was it. And and 30% of the cases were never solved. So, you know, you've got all of that stuff going on. But is there any way at this point to convince traditional science to really look at this thing? Or is it just a bunch of crazy people like me? And I won't say that you are among those crazy people, Kevin Randall, who continue to look into the subject. I interviewed James A. Van Allen about UFOs in the late 1970s, I think it was. And he was so confident of his place in the scientific community that he would talk seriously about UFOs without fear of retribution. And I think his point was that we needed to upscale the level of investigation. We needed to become more professional in our work about UFOs to be accepted by the scientific community. Now, some 15 years ago, I tried to start at least some of that with with uh, looking at peer review as a way of doing it. And I did a long paper on the Mantell case, the air, air guard pilot who was killed chasing a flying saucer in 1948. Well, actually chasing a balloon in 1948, but that's another story. But I looked at that and I put together a long paper as a kind of a model of how I would think this would do and then asked for comments to update, change, m- manipulate, criticize, whatever, got very few responses um, to that. But I, I, I thought that was what we needed to do, was start preparing that sort of documentation. If you go back and you look at the idea of meteors, uh, you know, rocks from the sky, and they say, well, in 1803, the French Academy of Scientists rejected the idea of rocks from the sky. But two years later, they accepted it. And why did they accept it? It's because someone presented them with the scientific evidence of a rock fall from the sky, including eyewitness testimony, which, of course, in today's world, we just ignore completely. Uh, they, had, they had rocks that did not fit into the, the, the strata of the area where they were found because there had been a geological survey, coincidentally, like two years before, so they knew what, was, what the, um, the rock, the geology of the area was. He had the samples and all of that, and he presented his paper to the French Academy of Scientists, and they said, well, yeah, apparently rocks do fall from the sky. And we in the UFO community have too often been writing stuff for the popular press. You want to sell books, you have to embrace the idea of alien visitation. You cannot suggest 
solutions to sightings, regardless of what the sighting is and, and how legitimate that solution might be. And so you, you, you get a biased account of what's going on. And I think if, what we need to do is document some of this stuff much more carefully, which is one of the points of the, the ultimate Roswell book was to do that document everything. Here is where this information came from. Here is the original source of this information, as opposed to, well, this is what my brother told me two weeks ago type thing. And we too often do not do that. There have been attempts to do that. Um, uh, Ted Phillips with his catalog of landing trace cases, for example, is, is, is one of those things. Mark Rodiger put together a, a, a book about uh, electromagnetic effects and installing of car engines. And I went through that and I discovered a fact that nobody, nobody really had talked about, which is, you know, they say, well, it installed my car engine. The condom committee says, but there's no mechanism for the car engine to start spontaneously after it's been stopped by an electromagnetic field, for example. And I went back through the book and almost all of the cases, they said, they said the car started normally again. Oh, they made they, they took some action to start the car. It wasn't that it spontaneously restarted, but the driver took some action, said the car started normally again. And almost every one of the cases, they did some action that started the car. So that Condon Committee criticism of the electromagnetic effects was not legitimate because they, like the rest of us, seem to think that when the uh, UFO left, the car would restart itself. The lights would come back on. The radio would come on, but to get the car started, you had to take some action. And that wasn't always reported properly in the, in the documentation. We have Kevin Randall with Gene and Chris. You're in the Paracast. We are America's largest independently owned communications network, GCN. Graphic Converter is the image manipulation tool for the rest of us. It does not use any database. You get full control of all your files. Want to view the images of a folder? Drag it into Graphic Converter and a powerful browser opens up to show your image files. You could use it for slideshows. You could use it to import images from digital cameras or from scanners. Need to do some image editing? You can do that too in Graphic Converter. Also print catalogs convert from so many formats i can't even list them download now to see if graphic converter is good for you like one and a half million other users guess what you could save money when you buy graphic converter use the coupon code night owl use the coupon code night owl to get a special price for graphic converter go to lemkesoft.com that's l-e-m-k-e soft.com lemkesoft.com l-e-m-k-e soft.com Can heart and body extract help with other ailments besides heart conditions, high blood pressure, clogged arteries, or unbalanced cholesterol? It did for Karen. I've been using heart and body extract for approximately two weeks. I've had an earwax buildup problem for many years, with over-the-counter stuff not working at all. I had very poor hearing due to this earwax buildup. Well, after two weeks of taking heart and body extract, my earwax buildup almost completely cleared up. Could this? Be the effect of better body circulation? Heart and Body Extract is an effective 100% organic nutritional supplement specially formulated to allow your body to heal itself. My hearing is almost completely back to normal. I'm amazed. Order by calling 866-295-5305 or online at hbextract.com. That's 866-295-5305 or hbextract.com. Heart and Body Extract for long and healthy life. Hi, this is Steve Sanchez, and based on a recent study, it was found that 57 million Americans had legal issues over the last 12 months, but only 60% of those studied sought out the services of a lawyer. Why? In a nutshell, affordability. While my friends at Legal Shield have created a solution that can help you not if, but when you need an attorney. For as little as $17 per month, Legal Shield will provide you unlimited access to qualified attorneys at an accomplished law firm for advice and counsel on legal issues no matter how serious or trivial. 
For over 40 years and with 1.4 million families across North America, Legal Shield can help you, the loyal GCN listener. Representatives are standing by now to answer your questions, so call them now at 1-855-340-SAVE. That's 1-855-340-7283 or visit them at lsprotection.com. That's lsprotection.com. Results will vary from case to case. Attention taxpayers, if you've received a notice from the IRS or state, do not ignore it. It's also a big mistake to try and handle your tax problem on your own. If you owe back taxes, it's a fact that the government has the power to take everything you own, including your home, business, wages, savings, and your freedom. But here's the good news. There's a special toll-free tax hotline set up especially for you. This tax hotline will tell you about new programs that are geared to help you dramatically settle, reduce, or eliminate what you owe. But you have to call now. Take down this number or put it in your cell phone. But call 877-345-7645. That's 877-345. 345-7645. When you call, you get free information on how you can reduce or eliminate back taxes, including penalties and interest. You can also be helped if you have unfiled returns, a tax lien, wage garnishment, bank levy, or if you have been entered into a payment plan but can't make the payments. Don't make the big mistake in thinking you can ignore or handle your tax problem on your own. You can stop the collection process immediately at 1-877-345-7645. That's 1-877-345-7645. 1-877-345-7645. Hi, this is nuclear physicist lecturer Stanton Friedman. You are listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. So the action, Kevin Randall, you'd have to take would be start the car again. Turn the key. You had to start the car. Okay, so yes, because the power is on, your air conditioner might go on. In those days, of course, you didn't have air conditioners in cars. Or the radio would come on. But the physically starting on. the car, you started the car. I went through all the cases in, in Mark's book and, and some others that I'd found uh, in other other sources. And, and there's something you could have done, you know, anybody could have done today. Uh, and, and looked at it to see exactly what was said. And an awful lot of the times, the driver started the car engine. He had to turn the key or he had to push the starter button. He had to take some action to start the car. It did not start spontaneously. Hmm. And I think that's an important point when you're looking at the UFO field because, you know, they, the, the scientific community rejected the idea of the car starting spontaneously. And that is kind of a, a misconception based on the way some of the stuff was, was written. And if you looked at it closely, you discovered that they were actually starting the car. The car, the radio came back on, the lights came back on, and they, the car started normally. That's one of the things we could, you know, we we can look at. But I mean, Mark did a wonderful survey of that sort of thing as a subset of the of the UFO field. And by using that resource and a number of others, I was able to discover that one little sort of inconsequential fact. Yeah, it's significant. And and reported it here on the Paracast. Yeah, you see, that's yeah, the way so- to go. Dot yeah. your I's and cross your T's, folks. One one is reminded of that uh, funny scene of Richard Dreyfus in the truck in Close Encounters when the, his flashlight comes back on and scares the bejesus out of him. <laughs> I, I always love that scene. I was with making the devil's tower out of his mashed potatoes, but that's just me. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to be able to eat those mashed potatoes and see what makes you want to do that. <laughs> Well, you know, since we were talking a little bit about science fiction, now here, here's a question from someone who has been a poster at uh, forum.theparacast.com since 2009. And Kevin, this is a testament to uh, your drawing power here. He's only posted 10 times in all that time. He has an interesting question here, and, and, and this is something I, I didn't know. He says, Kevin has written a lot of science fiction novels. What are his first three steps in creating a new sci-fi novel? I didn't know that you wrote science fiction novels. Yes, yes, I do. I didn't but know you that. You haven't well, listened to Stan Friedman complaining. Randall writes science fiction, therefore he cannot be believed. <laughs> oh boy! Well, you see, I write science fiction too, so I'm really yeah, you're, in the doghouse here. I am well, a lifetime well, member of the Science Fiction Writers of America. Well, there you go. So, so what are your first three steps in creating a new sci-fi novel or a, a plot or, or coming up with a, a unique idea that you can base a book on? The one I really like is a book called Remember the Alamo, where we send time travelers back to win the Battle of the Alamo. This came to me in a dream. I dreamed I was sitting in an uh, office with an editor wanting to do a book about time travelers going back to the Alamo. And the editor said, but only if there's Mexican time travelers, too. 
And so out of that. Whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, But only if there's Mexican time travelers? Two. Also, not only American time travelers, but Mexican time travelers. What about Russian? What about British? They weren't at the Alamo. Yeah, they. (laughs) Okay, so it's the Alamo. Okay, fine. Yeah, it's the Alamo. So, I mean, Mexicans and Texicans, you know. But but when the book was written, there were no Mexican time travelers in it. But there is another force at work there. But but I mean that was that was one of them. Uh, one of the one of the books came about because an editor asked me a question, and I said I can do that. Time travel has always fascinated me. So I've, I've I've looked at a lot of different time travel stuff. I did a book which you could you can it's an ebook you can go buy it cheap on on uh, Amazon uh, called on the second Tuesday of next week. Where the there are actually two groups fight, fighting a big battle out near Pluto, and kind of based on the Battle of Midway, and uh, the Earth forces win the battle, which they shouldn't have done because the bad guys were so superior. And then the the guys who are out traveling in space, they come back, uh, uh, and and they discover we've now lost that battle, and they're trying to figure out what happened. We we won one. We won when I left. And and of course, what they what they learn is their the mechanism of traveling interstellar distances is also one of the ways of of traveling through time, and it kind of protected them from the change that the bad guys made. And so it's trying to figure out where can we make a change that the bad guys can't reverse. And so you go through the whole book trying to figure out who's going to end up winning this thing because they keep going back to change change the outcome of this battle. It's, and it's called on the second Tuesday of next week, and it came about because that was kind of a you know, phrase we used in college. When are you going to get this done? Well, how about the second Tuesday of next week? You know, um, <laughs> so it, it kind of evolved out of that um, that 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 thing. Um, and, and well, one of the books we did was called Seeds of War. I did it with Bob Cornett, and we wanted to uh, we wanted to write, write a science fiction novel. You know, a military-oriented science fiction novel with with a, a big, big military component to it, and we started using the Gulf of Tonkin speech. Only we modified it to encompass the bad guys blowing up uh, one of our space probes in space, and we we create this retribution fleet to go take care of care of them for that that audacity. But we use we modeled it after the. Um, Johnson speech after the Gulf of Tonkin, and we just had to change a couple of words here and there, <laughs> you know, instead of instead of in in international waters to you know free space and things like that. But so it, it came, it evolved out of that. Yeah, that's and, a, that's a good that's a good approach. So so you know we just I, and I know when we go to when we went to science fiction conventions, people would say, well, where do you get your ideas? And we always had flip answers for it, but it, the ideas are just there. I had a notebook. Good Lord, 40 years ago, and, and as I was writing magazine articles and stuff, and I had I wrote down three ideas I had to, to write in the future so I'd know what I was going to do next. I don't think I ever wrote those three articles. Every, something's always come up, and, and I've gone in different directions. But the science fiction stories, um, it, just, it, it just really – something will trigger – you'll see something on television, you'll hear something, you'll, you'll see something else. Um, I know when we were doing the Alamo book, the um, movie, the final countdown had come out and you go to the movie and the, 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 the preview showed the modern aircraft carrier fighting the Japanese fleet attacking Pearl Harbor. And you think this is going to be really cool. And you get to the movie and you, it ends up that there's only a couple of dog fights with the modern fighters against the Japanese. And it's really just, you left, you left with something that you, you know, you wanted to see more. So I went back and I rewrote one of the scenes from the Alamo book to bring the modern weapons to play against the Mexican army as they were attacking the Alamo. And uh, because that's what I wanted to see in the movie. So we put a scene in the book that was just like that to show how the modern army, modern weapons would really break up a human wave attack uh, and that sort of thing. And then there was one scene where there they're shooting at the Mexican officers, and they're like a thousand yards away, and they're using their their sniper rifles. And one of the one of the Texans says, "You know, you can't hit anything at that range." And so, well, we can, you know, because they're using a modern sniper rifle. So they've got the range to try to take out the officers at a long, long distance. So you know, it's just the ideas are out there. They just, it's amazing. I uh, I did a book, which I think people actually kind of like, called Generationship, which was the idea of. What if you had this enclosed society 
traveling from Earth to another star system, but they can't travel beyond the speed of light. So you you have this um, sealed environment. And how do the people react to the sealed environment? And how do they get along? And and uh, how do you maintain everything in the status quo? Because you, you're not going to get help from Earth if you run out of food, you're pretty well screwed. You've got to recycle everything. You've got to, you've got to get along with the people, other people on the ship uh, and that sort of thing. So it just comes, it, 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 it's like that. Well, I had another dream too, that I did a book called the asteroid, which you can get on, on amazon.com as well uh, as a Kindle book. And it's, and it came, it came to me in a dream and it just sort of expanded out of there. So sometimes I dream the things up. Sometimes it's just something in the air around me that, uh, keys an idea. Uh, sometimes it it's um, somebody suggests, can you do something like this? We, you know, here's a contract. Can you do something like this? And yes, I can do something like that. So it's just well, all kinds of ways. We have a way to break. It's done this way. We have Kevin Randall with Gene and Chris. One more segment left. You're in the Paracast. <laughs> A little left, but always independent-minded. The Genesis Communications Network, GCN. Attack of the Rockoids has been well-received by critics and readers alike. It's a -a thrill-a-minute story you'll never forget. A former U.S. military intelligence officer is haunted by intense dreams about a beautiful woman pleading for his help after a terrible battle in outer space. But the dreams turn out to be true and thrust him into a telepathic love affair with a woman whose faraway planet is intent on destroying the Earth. And now the gripping tale continues in The Coming of the Protectors. It's the second book of the Rockoids trilogy, a galaxy-spanning adventure that pits our hapless heroes against powerful, fanatical enemies that threaten the lives of freedom-loving beings everywhere. Attack of the Rockoids and The Coming of the Protectors. Classic science fiction at its best. Available now. For more details, visit rockoids.com. That's R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S dot com. I had tried everything. I'd cut back the amount of food I was eating. I was lifting weights and jogging, but nothing was working. My body was literally starving for minerals and trace elements as well as key vitamins. And as soon as I had that, I immediately could eat half of what I was eating previously and be satisfied. Now, there are hundreds of great products at InfoWarsTeam.com, but I want to point out the three that have helped me lose 37 pounds in just two months. Products like Beyond Tangy Tangerine, Pollen Burst, and Rebound. When I started taking the Tangy Tangerine and other products every day, I lost more than 37 pounds in just two months. Now that's results. I want to challenge my listeners to go to InfoWarsTeam.com and to order just three of their products, and you will see the changes in the way you look, feel, and in your appetite almost immediately. Start your journey to health and wellness today. InfoWarsTeam.com. We live in a complicated society. Stressful issues are always popping up. Have you ever been treated unfairly by someone? Have you ever been overcharged for a repair? Have you ever signed a contract or a document worried about identity theft? How many times have you been in those unique situations where you just wanted to call an attorney to find out if you're right or wrong or what your legal rights are? But every time you think about calling an attorney, what do you think about first? That's right. Who do you call and how much will it cost? Our friends at Legal Shield have found a solution. With a nationwide network of 6,900 attorneys who average 19 years of experience, Legal Shield's law firms take over 40,000 calls per week helping their members. For less than $20 per month, you can have access to Legal Shield on everything from the trivial to the traumatic. Let Legal Shield stand up for your rights at lsprotection.com. That's lsprotection.com. Or call 855-340-SAVE, 855-340-7283. Results will vary from case to case. Hi, my name is DeRay, suffering from migraines, having Botox injections in my head and neck to alleviate pain, costing $1,500 out of my pocket. I discovered Dr. Ortman and Gentle Touch Chiropractic Adjustment called NUCA. I'm migraine-free since my first adjustment. Thanks for giving me my life back, Dr. Ortman. I wish they prescribed you instead of Botox. Thanks, DeRay. Putting the bones back in place is only half of the solution. 
We design a nutritional supplement program the body can handle, actually absorb, providing nutrients, targeting the problem area. Between NUCA and nutrition, we will have you on the road to a faster and more permanent recovery. Look us up on the web at drwartman.com or call 952-303-9124. Let us help you feel better faster. Wellspring Spinal Care at 952-303-9124. Again, that's 952-303-9124. Or on the web at drortman.com. Hi, this is Bryce Abel. I'm the producer of Dark Skies, the co-author of AD After Disclosure, and you are listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. All right, time travel, science fiction, Kevin Randall. We see a lot of that. We have TV shows like Continuum, a Canadian series on Sci-Fi Channel that plays around with time travel. We now have the TV series about the superhero, The Flash, where he goes back through time. They've got a reverse Flash who comes from the future. Twelve Monkeys. Twelve Monkeys. Going into its second season on a sci-fi channel that just wrapped up the first season. Okay, now. You haven't even made Game of Thrones. Oh, wait, that's not science fiction. That's fantasy, sorry. (laughs) But the point being, in the real world, as much as there's a real world, There are possibility here that UFOs are visitors from our future. People have asked me that frequently, and I always say I think it's unlikely. I think if you're looking at the possibilities of what we're experiencing, I think the most likely plausible explanation is alien visitation. There's interdimensional beings. There's time travelers from our future. And I actually did a science fiction story about that, Um, and one of the guys actually left a guidebook behind. And it was found in a collection of old library books. And they're looking at this. And here's stuff that's going on in the 21st century where the, you know, the time travelers would be looking at, seeing things like that. I think it's an unlikely scenario. But it's, it's one of those that, you know, if we're, going, if we're going to look at this with an open mind, we can't reject it out of hand. And if we look at some of the scientific thought going on now, they, they are talking about the feasibility of time travel. And we can say we're all time travelers. We're moving at the same speed into the future. It just takes us a while to get there. We do not have the capability to go back, but there are suggestions that that, you know, time dilation is a form of time travel. You know, as you move closer to the speed of light, time slows down for you. So you are sort of traveling through time. It's just, can you reverse the process? So yeah, it's a possibility, but I think it's a very unlikely possibility. I think, you know, as I said, alien visitation, I think is the most likely possibility interdimensional beings is a possibility. Uh, I think that some of the things we think of as UFOs are actually natural phenomena that have been misidentified, you know, so that really kind of takes them out of the, out of the case. But, I, you know, that's, that's kind of how I look at the whole thing. Time travel is a very unlikely possibility, but it is a possibility. I've often joked at uh, some conferences uh, where I presented that the answer to the cattle mutilation question, uh, you know, we can't factor out the possibility of cattle in the future becoming illegal as a protein source. And so maybe what we're seeing is high tech chefs coming back through time to gather illegal parts for million dollar plate dinners in the future. <laughs> or or if you want, if you read Stephen King's book, 19, uh, November 22nd, 1963, they have a portal back through time that the guy keeps going through and the owner of this diner is able to serve hamburgers much cheaper because he goes back into the past and buys the meat at really inexpensive prices and brings it into the future and <laughs> cooks it up and serves it. And so there you go. Your, your, your cattle mutilation theory right there by Stephen King. <laughs> and maybe wow. the fact is we all live in a gigantic dome. That's another Stephen King story, but that's only one town in Maine. What is this thing that Stephen King has here about these crazy towns in Maine? We've got the Dome. We've got Haven. You forgot and uh, the Dead Zone. Okay, you see, that's the point. Well, Well, he he lives lives in in Maine, Maine, so he writes what's familiar. Yeah, he lives in Maine. Doesn't want to spread his horizons? Oh, well. The stand, part of it takes place in Colorado and Las Vegas. Yeah, true. There you go. And so, some of it starts out in Maine, but because he lived, I guess he lived in Boulder for a while. So the exception that proves the rule. Hey, 
Kevin, we only have a few moments left. Yeah. Probably not time for another question for our listeners. But regardless of what happens with the Roswell slides on May 5th, and by the way, one of our forum regulars and a friend of the show, Red Pill Junkie, his real name is Miguel, as most of you know, Red Pill Junkie says he's going to attend the Roswell Slides event with a relative and promises to report back here on the show. So we'll set that aside. Where do you go from here to put together more research to advance a state of study of this field? Well, because you, because you said study, and, and that was the idea. You know, I've got a, a, a book in the back of my mind called Chasing Footnotes, and you look at a UFO case, and you chase the footnotes back to the original source and see what they say. Because a lot of times I found, I found information that, that either solves the case or continues to make it inexplicable but, but clears up some of the incongruities of those cases. So there's, there's things like that going on. And, and it, 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 some of the old UFO books would carry the story about this metal vessel blown out of solid rock in May, Massachusetts, and it was in the 1852 Scientific American. It's an inexplicable thing. And so I actually went and looked at the 1852 Scientific American and discovered that the case is actually much more interesting than this, this metal vessel. There's other stuff going on there. So it leads into other interesting things. But that, you know, that's one of the things to do is, is, is try to get the, the nonsense out of the field, explain the stuff that can be explained, and underscore the stuff that is really, really confusing and inexplicable. And look at that and say, here, here is the best information about this case that we have today. Well, we hope something about it bears fruit. Because yes. right now, I don't know, I think Chris and I have been so down on the field lately because of all these crazy claims and crazy arguments and all these flames. And we see that, as you know, in your blog, A Different Perspective, you'll write an article and there will be pro and con opinions. And sometimes the con opinions get to be a little eccentric to the borderline. Well, you know what I mean? The, sometimes the pro opinions get a little bit nasty too. Of course. As soon as I see those, I delete them. You know, you start calling people names and things like that. I'm going to delete the post. I don't need, we don't need that. If you want to discuss it rationally, if you want to say, well, this case is all poppycock and here's why I think that hey, I'm on board with it. If you want to say the guy who reports this is an idiot and a liar. No, uh, that gets deleted. So I, I know what you mean. I guess it'd be pretty crazy. Will we come to an answer to all this in your lifetime and my lifetime, Kevin, as a couple of old codgers? I believe I've already answered some of the questions. Um, and in fact, right here on the Paracast. <laughs> we will have more information after May 5th about the slides. We will, we will know exactly what they have and how they came to the conclusions they came to. We will know more of them, and it may it may explain a lot of stuff to us. It may just confuse the issue even more and become it may become more mysterious. We'll just have to wait for May the fifth to see what happens. Unfortunately, we can't all go to Mexico City to find out, but we'll keep looking for it. Kevin Randall, please tell our listeners where they can find more of the stuff that you do. They could look at my blog. It's kevinrandall.blogspot.com. A different perspective. You type in Roswell slides now, and a number of my columns for the for the blog will come up, so that you can you can read those. Go to the bookstore, buy books. Amazon's got a lot of the books. The latest, the last one that has come out is the government UFO files. Uh, there's some science fiction stories there. There's a nice there's a nice uh, horror novel called Vampire that you can you can look at. There's some inexpensive science fiction. There's some UFO stuff there, and the new book will be out in October. He's a busy bee, folks. We're busy here over at the Paracast. We also have a couple of Facebook Paracast fan clubs, and we can't combine them because you have to kill the content from one. And we're not going to do that. So we'll still have two Paracast fan clubs. We also have a free copy of Chris O'Brien stalking the tricksters to give away. Here's how you get a copy. Go to plus.theparacast.com. That's plus.theparacast.com. We want you to sign up for the Paracast Plus. A yearly subscription is $50. Five years is $175. There is a $5 monthly subscription, but you don't get the free book. Regardless, what this means here is that you get the After the Paracast podcast, which is like part two of this show, color commentary, sometimes continuing the discussions. 
from this show. Sometimes we do something totally unexpected after the PowerCast. With the PowerCast, we present the ad-free version, 41 minutes of ads chopped off, better quality audio, PowerCast Plus. Go to plus.thepowercast.com and go to Chris O'Brien's site, ourstrangeplanet.com. And you can help him with his project to set up that camera network in the Mysterious Valley. And it's already making progress, as we mentioned in the beginning of the show. And you, Kevin Randall, thank you so much for joining us again on the Paracast. I was delighted to be here, but your coffee sucks. Well, we'll go to Starbucks next time. I thought you'd like the Circle K brand. I would prefer the Circle K brand to Starbucks because Starbucks has too much money. The Paracast, featuring Gene Steinberg and Christopher O'Brien, is a copyrighted presentation of Making the Impossible Incorporated. Tune in next week for a new adventure in The Paracast.